not really uh, Sacramento bureaucrats, right? You go on the state legislature, all the programs are down by, uh, by line items. Therefore, we structure our programs that have specialists by line items. And I say, we'll get this money and we'll, we'll allocate it out to students. And I think most campuses are structured very similarly. So we have offices by line items and we provide service to our students. But our students are navigating they have to know where to go first, and they have to know, right, there's no certainty just because they hit one, they will, they, even though they're eligible for others, they may not be guaranteed to be able to have access to other programs, right? And some of the things on the left, intake forms, eligibility, application, verification, again, I don't need to go down the list, but that's what students experience. So if you see, there's a definitely an asym asymmetrical experience between kind of our expectation and our hope, and then actually the students receive. And that's why from the Chancellor's Office, we're really thinking about how to uh, work with the field to reimagine what student services could look like. And um, this is the, the, the social determinants framework that the Chancellor's Office has been kind of uh, uh, pushing out to the field to really support program design and reimagination. Really changing the paradigm from just individual programs to how we think about student centered support ecosystem. Right? And then when we think about that, uh, the three core social determinants are financial stability, physical, mental well-being, and support networks. What we're saying is every individual, students or not, needs a fundamental level of these three things to be able to survive and thrive. So if a student comes in with a deficit in one or more of these areas, which are often for all of our students, many of our students in all of these areas, that is our institutional responsibility to get them to that fundamental foundational level. If not, then we have to really manage our expectation. And when we say our commitment is open, our open access for every single student, they're not going to be successful. It, they're just not going to. So how do we live with that reality and think about that? And it's important to have that conversation because now it's shifting the responsibility to us as institutions and figuring out what that looks like. Right? And then what that hopes to do is to uh, have support our institutions to better clarify problems, maximize resources, and shift structures. I will go into a little bit more into our framework, but before I go into it, I just want to pull one of my favorite quotes is, every framework is wrong, some are helpful. So I'm going to give you something to support your thinking, right? And if you're, you're saying this, some of it doesn't work for my institution, for my situation, totally fine. If you want to pitch it, that's, that's also very much okay, right? The key is to really encourage the thinking around clarifying problems, maximize resources, and shift structures. All right, so mental well-being as a core social determinant. How do we think about that, right? We're really thinking about this as a continuous journey. Right, staying healthy is really, um, you know, the things we do to maintain good mental health, to promote mental well-being, right? And then the getting better piece is really the seeking treatment and support, and there's the professional intervention piece. And then the last piece is really living with it is a long-term management of a mental health condition, right? It's in, I think what's most important is to think about the visible and invisible journey. That's that, that you know, people go through and their families go through, right? So, and I think about us institutions, when we are trying to solve problems, we're often focused on the, on the visible symptoms. So I think a lot of the conversations are focusing on like, the treatment piece around mental illness, right? But there's so much of it, right? They're back and forth, every individual goes through their invisible. And that's why I think uh, I love this theme of building a culture of community, is you need to have a compassionate, inclusive community and creating that sense of unconditional, unconditional belonging, that is fundamentally going to, right, to support, you know, students in this entire spectrum, right? All right, next, so we're gonna go into a little bit into the framework, so clarifying the problems. You know, the questions we're thinking about, right, in this is really identifying both upstream factors and downstream challenges. So like what the symptoms look like and what are the root causes look like. And I don't know if you guys can tell, but you know, I actually, in addition to Jobs for the Future, I work for, um, for uh, a managed care organization supporting the Medicaid population. So when we think about social determinants of, edu uh, social determinants of educational success, it's very much like the social determinants of health, right? Which is really to say, you know, 
when you are able to identify problems of, you know, downstream and upstream, then the solution, then it demands a comprehensive solution. You cannot use a healthcare solution to solve a social problem, right? So how do we really understand the different layers of a problem that will help us really generate solutions and that, that will force us to have a collaborative partnership across the board, right? And then, so what is the problem we're trying to solve? And I love this picture. I feel like this will be, this can be a whole week of, right, deep conversations to tie. You know, all of these words, they are, they are in the deeper uh, layers to uh, the mental health challenges we all face in this country today, right? And that's why, and we're only scratching the surface if we think of this as a Right? And that is why when we, again, so when we identify the problem to be this complex, to be this multifaceted, then we need to have conversations like today, right? We need to partner with all of the organizations at Ocean, and thank you for, for having those conversations, right? That is very much needed to really understand how do we work all the way to think about microaggression, discrimination, racism and all of that, how that impacts how we, how we live, how we behave, how we interact with one another. All right, second, the second part of the framework is maximizing resources, right? Maximizing resources does not mean I let me take the money. I want to make it very clear, because a lot of times when we talk about resources, people kind of get guarded, right? Like, are you taking my money? Can I get your money? Can I get more money, right? Money is good, more resources is good, but I think the conversation is really focusing on the intervention that's needed, solutions that's needed for, this, for the person in the middle. So we think about student-centered approach, right, in the higher education context. And then be realistic about limits of every single intervention. I think often we, as, you know, when we have a program, we have, you know, these audacious goals to serve students end to end. But we gotta know we can't. Right? We just cannot. So like, I think what was a really important learning is that actually about the limitations of the progress, and then, then we can seek out and be intentional with our partnership. So in increasing capacity and high-touch interventions alone is necessary but insufficient, right? And that's kind of speaking to, you know, all of our care local programs do a lot of the high-touch interventions and a lot of expertise in the area, but you're not going to be able to serve 1.8 million students because then it's not a care local. Program. And it has to have some kind of eligibility requirements because legislatively your program can only serve a subpopulation of the students. Right? So knowing the limitation but knowing the expertise is where the power is. So we can really collaborate across different programs and then also bring in right general operations, budget administration, right? All of that leadership needs to be part of this conversation. Equity work cannot stay just in that kind of local program. Um, so, and instruction is a big part of it, right? How do we really think about the EIA affirming curriculum redesign, right? Budget administration, you know, where money, where you put your money, really shows value. And then general operations, you think about campus policing, campus climate conversations, right? How do we, so there's a lot of places where, when we think about unconditional belonging for our students, that means every minute when students on campus, physically or virtually, and that's everything. So at every intersection point, you need to have equity in mind, you need to have a sense of inclu inclusion and unconditional belonging in mind. And that's why we provide all institutional resources, not just money, right? Next one, so when we talk about categorical programs, this is just an illustration. These are some of the programs that I oversee. And there are other programs you'll see, so academic affairs under, uh, Actually, Dr. John Stanskis, you know, there's the Puente program over there, the Motion program over there, right? So scholarship programs over there. So this is not inclusive. But what I'm trying to illustrate is how we look at the way we deliver delivery services. Guided pathways and student equity and achieve guided pathways actually now there's no money attached to it. It's a framework, right? Student equity and achievement still has it's half a billion dollars. These are two programs or initiatives or framework that's really driving that systems change, right? Those are big uh, dollar amounts that encourages and pushes the system and colleges to look at data, make data-driven decision-making, really focus on equity. You know, you look at equity, so when we, and if you look at equity, there's no doubt 
that racial equity, racial, uh, racial inequity is the biggest equity gap within our system. Then we are then pushing the institution to think about then what do you do about it, right? So those are the two big ticket items for the colleges to really think about fundamentally change the way it organizes uh, initiatives and, and programs and people, right? And then if you look at the gold bottom, Right, the CCP, so, so you see the financial aid programs. Many of them are financial aid programs, and you see basic needs programs, you see health and mental health programs, administration, administration the records, all that. Those are, some of them are funded, some of them are not, but those are what we think of as institutional foundational programs, really aim to serve uh, everyone or a vast majority of students. So these programs have the added responsibility to, to really prioritize the structural changes. Because you cannot, like you can serve one student at a time, but if the, the nature of these programs are supposed to serve many, therefore their most important priority is to make structural changes. So when the students come in, they will experience something fundamentally different, right? Not just a special, like, oh, I know a counselor, come in and help me get a VIP treatment. So then this student experienced good, had a good experience, but others, not so much. You have to follow, follow the whatever. I think about the airline, right? You have the TSA, you have the non-TSA. So fundamentally, if you want to serve everyone, you got to remove those lines and figure out a way, right? And then you see the middle, which we have the EOPNS, the CARE program, CalWORKS, and that stuff. Those are more high-touch programs. So really think about how these programs can, can um, uh, leverage their uh, expertise to really continue to uh, improve on the outcomes through high-touch innovations. So what I'm saying here is every different types of programs, because of the structure of those programs, they should serve different purposes, but all of them need to work together, right, to, to address student needs and, and, and uh, support equity. All right, the last one, which is shifting structures. So what do I mean by that, right? is really assess the impact of the existing interventions and then think about structural changes, but then at the same time understand the constraints of state and federal requirements, and then in the end, figure out common workaround and then have joint efficacy. What I really want to focus on is, if you look at the three boxes on the bottom, the far right one, increase access. I feel like that is something that we tend to do a lot, right? When we find something to be helpful, we say, okay, let's bring more students into this. Let's give them more help. Right? But that's super labor intensive and super capital intensive. And so, you know, building a culture of community to me also means how do we collectively shift the burdens from students, right? And then push for policy reforms. So I've kind of mentioned a little bit. So this is just something that I uh, we created to just illustrate the point, right? There's their programs are meant to serve the many. Their programs are meant to serve the few. Both programs are super important, but they need to work together, right? So illustration, so if you think about serving the many programs, their goal should be shifting burdens. That's their priority, right? Serving the many programs, their priority then is to increase access. So, um, so if you look at just different colors, so like Universal Design for Learning and DSPS is a good example, right? DSPS is providing accommodations, individual accommodations for students. But you need the universal design learning uh, principles embedded in the classroom so that it will alleviate the pressure of ESPS so that they can actually provide even more accommodation for students, right? Second example, book vouchers and no-cost textbooks, right? Well, we have no-cost textbooks. So right now, you know, a lot of students in our categorical programs will have, can receive book vouchers or book grants or college books, right? But we are also at a system level trying to push a system level initiative around low or no cost textbooks and instructional materials that include supplies. If we're able to say, for example, I hope we get there, every college student, doesn't matter what class you take, you will not pay more than $50 for everything, including supplies, exams, textbooks, whatever it is. $50 is your, is your cap. Then you think about how that fundamentally will change how categorical programs will provide programs. Right? So again, it's like how do you serve this view, how do you serve the many? We have to really think about both. Food pantry and health fresh. I'm not gonna go into it more detail, but if you think about it, it's very similar, right? And how we think about different programs to serve different functions to get the highest and best use, if you will. Alright, so this is my last slide. 
this obviously is not a, conclu a conclusive list, and, and that's the area where you know, the Chancellor's Office really hopes to further partner with all of you. But really, again, think about the approaches that colleges and the system can support in efforts they are shifting burdens, and efforts they are increasing access for mental health, right? Shifting burdens, you will see trauma-informed approach that's part of the board resolution to increase system-level competency trauma-informed care. So it's not just about trauma-informed care in mental health intervention space. It's about trauma-informed care in policing, trauma-informed care in records administra uh, uh, administration, right? trauma-informed care in financial aid and in, in classrooms. So it needs to be a system-level capacity building. DEI affirming campus, I just want to bring a couple of things that are, that are fairly tangible. Campus climate and public safety regulations have been passed, really are mandating colleges to really review and update that. And then EEO innovative best practices are also in place right now to support colleges to really diversify its, its uh, faculty and uh, administrators and also really support uh, that type of evaluation, right? In, in, um, in really uh, overall uh, increasing, uh, enhancing student experience. And then culturally responsive learning environment is another one, um, ASCCC and uh, 5C in partnership with the Chancellor's Office co develop this DEI and curriculum model principles to really encourage faculty to really look into re the redesign their, their, their curriculum. And then what I mentioned, social determinants of educational success as a framework to think about our work collaboratively. And then increased access, I feel like you're all the experts here, so I'm not going to mention all of them, but what's important, what I haven't seen the momentum, which we want to really focus on is medical enrollment for our students, if you think about, right, the mental health services that they can actually receive. And then reimbursement support is another area we want to think about. So currently, a lot of our mental health centers are providing services based on the mental health funding and the student health fees. But many of the services can be eligible for medical and I know that's a lot of burden for colleges to take on, so we are talking with um, Health and Human Services to think about how do we support colleges in doing that, that, that then creates additional resources for free option resources, right, for colleges to provide additional services. Um, expansion of telemental health and flexible in-person options, and I think about the technology procurement piece of it, that's something uh, the Chancellor's Office is really thinking about to support system-wide. Um, local partnership, I want to say, you know, again, thinking about the theme today, cultural community. What does that look like to partner with local organizations around resources, access, and data, and how we can even potentially take a more active role as a resource hub for the community, right? Bring that community concept back into community colleges. And then always funding advocacy, but I think at a state level right now in a budget type, a tight budget year, the question we will have to continue to wrestle with and advocate and want to partner with you is what is our unique proposition, right? And unique value in this. Because Prop uh, 63 right now already has mental health dollars, right? What we're asking the state to do is reallocate dollars from you know, granted from the public mental health organ system into our system. So we have to be able to tell the story of why us, why we can use the money more effectively in what way. So that's something, and why prevention is so important and tie all of that into our overall economic and social mobility agenda for the system. So that is uh, really the last slide. Um, those, so if you take nothing from this conversation today, those are the questions about social determinants framework that I think uh, are helpful for colleges to wrestle through, is when you're serving students, think about who you're serving, who you're not serving. That's more important, who you're not serving, that need to be served, right? And then what practices and policies promote outcomes and which one undermine? Because you might have the best intention, but listen to the students. How are they experiencing it? And then uh, what are the solutions that can be it alone and then across multiple governance contexts. And I know mental health is an area where many of the practitioners have been doing things on their own for so long. And actually our categorical programs have also been grappled with mental health challenges for their students for a very long time on their own. So how do we come out together and leverage the resources and power across all different governance structures? Um, and then it's, you know, how do we again talk about the efficiencies in use of state funds to access student um, success, to prioritize student success. So that's the end of my, and I, I think I'm going to stay with uh,
will stay in my welcome as well. So, uh, You'll, you'll be back. <laughs> yeah, we need we need to talk with you now and get it get on your calendar right right after this meeting. Thank you so very very much. Can we get another round of applause? And end all for the topic of colonialism. 
And I'm going to talk about the specific features of colonialism, how historical trauma is reflected among our communities, and how anti-fatness is connected to anti-blackness, and food eating, and colonialism. And I would like to formally introduce myself from my ancestral background. I am from the coastal people of Nawa people in Michoacan, an unknown indigenous ancestry from my mother's side, and locations from Jalisco, Aguacalientes, Guanajuato, and Colima. And this is a moment to acknowledge both the past and present, and how the U.S. was founded and built on slavery and oppression, and its effects are still felt today. This is a time to respect the elders both past and present that have stored the lands throughout many generations. We acknowledge that we are currently situated on the ancestral land of the Coast Miwok people. The Miwok community endured the history of mistreatment and forced displacement at the hands of the California and federal governments, the Spanish missions, the Mexican landowners, and more. In 2000, legislation was enacted to restore federal recognition to the Federated Indians of Great and Nigeria. This community represents the Federation of Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo groups, recognized as an official tribe by the U.S. Congress. And land acknowledgments are not only a time of reflection and how colonialism is still a very active process, but this is a reminder that the land must be given back to indigenous peoples. Not only do we owe the land back, but because indigenous knowledge operates at a much finer spatial and temporal scale than science. Genocide of indigenous peoples, plants, and land wisdom has led to the global climate catastrophe that we are experiencing today. Indigenous people play a critical and leadership role in combating global climate change. Land acknowledgments are nothing without action, so this is a reminder that we all have a role in giving back the land. I also like to do an ancestor acknowledgement when I do my work because I wouldn't be here if it weren't for all the sacrifices that were done before me. And this is also a time to acknowledge all indigenous black enslaved peoples that were forced to work the lands, whose names and existences are rarely acknowledged, and who built multi-generational wealth for white families. I also want to acknowledge people that have passed away due to medical weight stigma and eating disorders, and a time to acknowledge our ancestors and their sacrifices and their reluctance to become extinct. And I also would like to provide some disclaimers. I will be speaking about African chattel slavery, so giving a heads up to all our black community members here today. Also, I'll be talking about eating disorders, sexual violence, and other types of historical violence. I like to forewarn because this is a way that we take care of each other and allow survivors to prepare and disengage, it must. And I, I primarily focus on this presentation on indigenous native peoples and covering lightly on the uh, black community, and so I just want to give that disclaimer. And some guidelines that I like to establish when talking about size and eating disorders with sensitivity is avoid stating specific numbers associated with weight, size, uh, body movement. Numbers tend to overwhelm people with eating disorders, so it's best just to avoid it and generalize statements. Obviously, avoid giving diet tips and describing other people's bodies. And also, avoid stating specific eating disorder behaviors. Another one that is 
something that I, come, that I always um, address is abstaining from using the words obese, obesity, and overweight. I call them the O words. These are terms that have pathologized people in larger bodies and has created a lot of harm. And it is a dehumanizing term. The more commonly accepted term is fat. People in larger bodies, higher weight, but these all words in within the fat liberation um, groups and movements, it's usually not um, brought up. No food shaming is allowed, and this is an opportunity to really challenge how we define beauty, value, and health, and um, also what is considered normal. I really want to encourage everyone here today to, to, to challenge that, to question it. And last but not least, speak from your heart. The first question I start off with, who's stubborn America? <coughs> Usually, in general population, people say Columbus, right? And a lot of us have learned even the rhyme song and sell the blue seas and here we are today. But what is already talked about is the beginning of one of the biggest genocides in human history. Or how he would supervise the selling of native girls to sexual slavery to his men. He forced natives to work in his gold mines until they died of exhaustion. And if an Indian, quotation marks, worker did not deliver his full quota of gold dust by Columbus's deadline, soldiers would cut off the man's hands and tie them around his neck to send a message. And the list goes on of unspeakable acts that he committed, but yet there's still streets named after him. There's still statues of him, not only in the US, but throughout Latin America. What's really talked about is again, the beginning and his contribution to one of the biggest genocides in history. And every colonial power has a creation myth story. In the US, it's usually these four things. Columbus discovered America, settlement of the pilgrims, um, independence from England, and westward expansion. But what's not really talked about is the content that exists in the books that are currently being banned in so many locations in the US. Let's talk about colonialism. So colonization is land acquisition. It is land theft and exploitation. So that is the physical action of taking over and theft. Colonialism is a system of domination. So taking over by any means necessary, may it be military, political, economic, psychological, diplomatic, cultural, etc. And it does not work in a linear way, such as sometimes colonialism is talked about as in it already happened, but no, it's still happening. Wazi Yatawin, a Dakota writer, teacher, and activist, says that colonialism is the massive fog that has clouded our imaginations regarding who we could be, excised our memories of who, were, who we once were, and numb our understanding of our current existence. Colonialism is a force that this allows us from recognizing its confines, while at the same time limiting our vision of possibilities. Colonialism is the force that compels us to feel gratitude for small concessions, while our fundamental freedoms are denied. Colonialism has set the parameters of our imaginations to constrain our vision of what is possible. Now, coloniality, that term permeates all levels of society, subjectivity, and the modern world system. So the colonial tentacles that live in our thought systems, economy, gender, bodies, technology, etc. 
So coloniality refers to the control and management of knowledge by universals of Western modernity, Eurocentricism, and global capitalism. So as such, Eurocentric knowledge and practices are deemed neutral, universal, and apolitical, and have led to the erasure of entire knowledge systems. Franz Bannon um, wrote on the wrench of the earth, colonialism is not satisfied merely with holding a people in its grip and emptying the native's brain of all form and content. By a kind of perverted logic, it turns to the past of the oppressed people and distorts, disfigures, and destroys it. This work of devaluing pre-colonial history takes on a dialectical significance today. And one way pre-colonial history is erased as it relates specifically to indigenous people in North America is settler colonialism. So settler colonialism is a distinct type of colonialism that functions through the replacement of indigenous populations with an invasive settler society. Settler colonialism destroys to replace. It is a structural system, not an event in history. In this sense, settler colonialism does not really ever end. It denies the existence of indigenous peoples and the legitimacy to claim its lands. It aims to banish indigenous peoples and replace them with settlers. Its logic of elimination requires the removal of indigenous people, peoples of a territory by any means necessary, homicide, child abduction, religious conversion, reprogramming via missions or boarding schools, for example, and other forms of assimil assimilation. Again, colonialism, settler colonialism destroys to replace. Hanani K. Trask, a Native Hawaiian academic, mentioned that the US is a country created out of genocide and colonialism, created out of bloody extermination of Native peoples, the enslavement of forcibly transported peoples, and the continuing oppression of dark skinned peoples. In settler colonialism, territory is fetishized. Land is the object of desire, the place where settlers can imagine a society of their choosing on land perceived as their own. In the heat of this desire, settlers rationalize the elimination of the indigenous who complicate the realization of their imagination. So what are the effects of colonialism? Well, one of them being military conquest. Much to the credit of European military success in the New World, quotation marks, it's handed down to the superiority of their weapons, their literary heritage, even the fact that they had unique load-bearing mammals such as horses. And these factors combined allow them to take over sophisticated civilizations such as the Mexicas and Inca people. And what gave Europe such imperial power was steel. Steel is almost uniquely European technology. And the military conquest is not something that is in the past, uh, but rather the US has the largest military budget of $801 billion and it has the most powerful military in the world. And so it's still happening today. As I mentioned earlier, colonialism works in circles. It's not linear. Another effect is epidemic disease. It is believed that 75 to 90% of all native deaths resulted from disease such as smallpox, influenza, bubonic plague, uh, scarlet fever, syphilis, and it was strategic, and it was used as a strategy for the genocide of indigenous people. 
By the close of the 16th century, the indigenous populations in central Mexico, Mexico alone decreased from 25 million to 1 million due to genocide, lack of immunity to European diseases, and slavery. And this is still impacted in indigenous communities. For instance, in Canada, indigenous people have a 15-year shorter life expectancy. Tuberculosis rates are 17 times higher in indigenous communities. Native American and Alaska Natives have a greater chance of having diabetes than any other U.S. racial group, and Latinx have higher rates of diabetes than both adults and children. Now, diabetes is more than a, meta, than a complicated metabolic condition. It is a complicated social issue that has been oversimplified. Jason Hell wrote on his thesis on the subject. He wrote, poverty, suicide, alcohol, and drug abuse, microaggressions, violence, and traumatic events exasperated by historical trauma contribute to a heightened level of stress. Research has linked stress and trauma on the onset of diabetes. Diseases are environmental. Environments still impacted by social inequity and colonialism. Nancy Krieger, who is a professor of public health at the Harvard School of Public Health, states that the only way we can understand population patterns of health, disease, and well-being is to see the embodied expression of the social conditions under which people live and how we, as biological creatures, embody that literally every day. In many ways, Native Americans are post-apocalyptic people. Let's not forget the course of assimilation that has occurred and continues to happen. The boarding school era, we are maybe familiar a few years ago, the findings of unmarked grave sites of children from these boarding schools. However, this was no secret among indigenous communities. And in Canada, it was mandated by federal law. 150,000 children, indigenous children in Canada, were displaced and forced in these schools. And these schools were agents of assimilation for native children. Andrew Paul, who was a survivor of a boarding school, said that there was unrelenting hunger. During his time at, at Aklavik Roman Catholic Residential School, he said, we cried to have something good to eat before we sleep. A lot of the times, the food we had was rancid, full of maggots, stink. Sometimes we would sneak away from school to go visit our aunts and uncles just to have a piece of bannock. Slavery was also a product of colonialism. Uh, the comienda system was created by Spanish to control and regulate um, indigenous labor. And under the encomienda system, conquistadores and other leaders, which were called encomenderos, received grants of a number of natives from whom they would exact tribute in the form of gold or labor. And the encomenderos were supposed to protect and Christianize the Indians, quotation marks, granted to them, um, but ultimately it was a system to enslave indigenous people. We also know about child slavery. This country has a very hard time talking about that. Um, from the 17th and 19th centuries, 12.5 million enslaved Africans were brought from Central and West Africa to the Americas. And by 1860, the nearly 4 million American enslaved slaves were worth some 3.5 billion, making them the largest single financial asset in the entire U.S. economy, worth more than all manufacturing and railroads combined. Enslaved people live with the constant threat of family separation. This is why this country has no issues separating families in the border. 
It is part of the fabric of the U.S. Anyone here familiar with Sora Neale Hurston, iconic um, Harlem Renaissance writer? Well, she was able to locate the last surviving captive of the last slave ship to enter um, in the U.S., Kuja Lewis. He was born in West Africa, originally named Kosula. He was only 19 years old when members of the neighboring Bahamian tribe captured him, kidnapped him, and took him to the coast. There he and about another 120 others were sold into slavery and crammed onto the Clotilda, the last slave ship to reach the continent of the United States. In his interview, he said, we very sorry to be parted from one another. We 70 days crossed the water from the Africa soil, and now they part us from one another. Therefore, we cry. Our grief, so heavy, look like we can't stand it. I think maybe I die in my sleep when I dream about my mama. He was an elder at this point, and he could still vividly remember that trauma of family separation. We could only imagine how multiple forms of family separation has created an intergenerational impact. Articles like these were common after the Civil War. This advertisement was placed in the Color Tennessee newspaper in Nashville, Tennessee on October 7th, 1865. And this one reads, information is wanted of my mother, whom I left in Buckyard County, Virginia in 1844. And I was sold in Richmond, Virginia to Samuel Copeland. I formerly belong to Robert Rogers. I'm very anxious to hear from my mother and any information in relation to her whereabouts will be very thankfully received. My mother's name was Betty and was sold by Coldbridge to James French. Any information by letter will be thankfully received. Thornton Copeland. Whose last name does he have? Slave owner. Another effect of colonialism is religious and spiritual suppression. The Christianization of natives and Africans stripped them from their organic uh, spirituality and healing and were then only to be appropriated, commercialized for the benefit of white people's spiritual discovery and profit. For instance, yoga, indigenous midwifery methods, Native American drumming, ayahuasca, and the list goes on. Bartolome de las Casas once remarked that the Indians preferred to go to hell to avoid meeting Christians. In the new Christian patriarchy, women had no leading roles in the church. According to Women in the Crucible of Conquest by Carrie Mayer of Powers, under the new Christian patriarchy, women were then forced to depend on men to intercede for them with the male god and mostly male saints. Pachamama and Tosi were gone as many other goddesses. Gone were the powerful deities that embodied both genders such as Inca y Cuiracocha. So women who operated complex spiritualities and held leadership positions among their people from one day to the other were removed of that. And I argue that's one of the reasons why women and femmes that come from this diaspora have so many psychological issues because we lost our voice and our power and we can't even name that. In the essay, The Social Cultural Context of African American and White Americans, Women's Race, states that as early as 1660, in colonial American laws, encouraged the quotation marks, sexual tyranny 
of African American slaves by slave owners to enhance owners' economic and social gain. Slave owners especially victimize African American women. Offspring from the rape of African American women slaves by slave owners increased slave populations and owners holdings. Moral justification for the sexual oppression and exploitation of African American slaves stems from 15th century Christian missionary attitudes that vilified the sexual appetite, quotation marks, of Africans. And stereotypes about male African American sexual prowess and the sexual promiscuity of African American women lingers to this day. So this hypersexualization of black people originates from child slavery and originated as a way to dehumanize and to justify the sexual exploitation of black peoples. Um, in the book Sexual Violence and the American Indian Genocide, stateside in the colonial imagination, native bodies are also imminently polluted with sexual sin. Therefore, they were undeserving of integrity and viable at all times. The extent to which native peoples are not seen as real people indicated the success of sexual violence. So female bodies were a supreme threat to dominant European colonialism. So therefore, symbolic and literal control over their bodies is important in the war against native women. And what happens when you are continuously degraded, disrespected, and not seen as human? You internalize that. And when you internalize that, that leads to all these other self-harm behaviors. And so, this is what I'm talking about women, but also what their gender folks, two-spirit folks, folks that don't fit within the European Western idea of gender, such as man and woman, all these other identities were also repressed. And there's also instances of mass murders of two spirits. And that caused a lot of disbalance, especially in, within California tribes, because two spirits did a lot of ceremony that was connection to ecology. And so once that was erased, that all trickles down to even our current climate. And I mean, what do I need to say about environmental degradation today? You just gotta look at the news and you see it everywhere. Maui, Canada, Spain, and the list goes on. And um, what's already talked about is how indigenous territories have been used to locate native hydroelectric dams, mines, or uranium, coal, copper, and other metals essential to U.S. industry. Conduct nuclear weapons testing during the Cold War, site petroleum wells and pipelines, and other energy producing facilities, and dump municipal, industrial, and, fe and federal, and military toxic and radioactive waste. Indigenous territories, also known as reservations, have been treated worse than dump sites. And for thousands of years, indigenous communities have been caretakers of the environment and utilizing traditional knowledge passed down through generations. Indigenous peoples are critical guardians of biodiversity. And though indigenous people comprise of about 6% 6, 6 of the global population, they protect 80% of biodiversity, biodiversity in the world. A record of 227 environmental activists were murdered in 2020. Global Witness Report found that, and that number is likely to be an undercount. And many killings are linked to logging, mining, agriculture, and indigenous people are heavily targeted. And we know what's happening, part of the reason the fires are grew so much in, in the Maui fires was 
because of the invasive plants introduced by sugarcane fields and the decline in annual rain. All of that made it the perfect condition. So we have these fires today. So if we look at this, what I call the snowball effect, each square being a generation with more developed forms of oppression and colonialism to where we are now, where it's embedded in every institution. And we still dealing with poverty, high levels of inequality, and also historical amnesia, not knowing where we come from, not knowing the history of this land, not even sometimes having the language for it. Of course, all of this will compound and become historical trauma. And Dr. Maria Gela Horse Braveheart explains historical trauma as complex, collective, cumulative, and intergenerational psychosocial impacts that resulted from the depredations of past colonial subjugation within a specific group of people who share a specific identity or affiliation. And we could look at this conceptual model in which mass trauma experience, then there's the dominant group that oppresses and subjugates a group of people, and does so by many means, some segregation, displacement, destruction, cultural dispossession. And then we have the first generation, the primary generations after that, and then there's a traumatic response to that. Psychological response, depression, panic, anxiety disorders, social response, substance abuse, unemployment, intimate partner violence, and physical response, compromised immune system, nutritional stress, and doctrine impairment. And then we have, consequently, the following generations. And the way that all of this is passed on is uh, physiological, genetic, environmental, social, economic, political systems, and legal and social discrimination. So it continues to be passed on. So specific features of historical trauma include psychic numbing, anger, voicelessness, becoming an, an oppressor and abuser of others after suffering abuse to oneself, disconnection from the natural world, suicidal ideation, internalized sense of inferiority, low self-esteem, deep-seated sense of shame, self-destructive behaviors, fear of personal growth, spiritual confusion, alcohol and drug abuse, reenacting affliction within one's own life, and for the folks that are identified as BIPOC here, we all have that one family member, or maybe it's you, <laughs> I don't know, but continuously addresses stress and trauma to oneself in the cycle, can get out of it. That's what that means, reenacting affliction with one's own life. Depression, dysfunctional families, and interpersonal relationships. When I first saw this, I understood why my family was the way that it was and why my community was hurting so much, but yet nobody explained this to me. So now let's talk about the roots of anti-fatness. There was two historical developments that led to the fear of fat bodies. One of them being the rise of the transatlantic slave trade, and two, the spread of Protestantism. So racial scientific rhetoric about slavery linked fatness to greedy Africans. And religious discourse suggested that overeating was ungodly. In the United States, fatness became stigmatized as both black and sinful. And by the early 20th century, slenderness was increasingly promoted in the popular media as a correct embodiment for white Protestant women. So the phobia about fatness and the preference for thinness have not principally or historically been about health. It was never about health. And today, 
a lot of anti-fatness has, has nothing to do with health. The fear of the imagined fat black woman was created by racial and religious ideologies that have been used to both degrade black women and discipline white women. Elites are constantly working on differentiating themselves from, from subordinated groups, and so they often distinguish themselves by cultivating different tastes, diets, and physical appearances that are in opposition to those of subordinated groups. Anti-fatness became a tool for social distinctions, to normalize social hierarchies. So how did colonialism impact food? And unfortunately today, with a lot of food justice movements, there's so much anti-fatness and lack of eating disorder awareness. But one way in which food eating was impacted by colonialism was Europeans introduced this idea of the superior body being influenced by food. So we see the beginnings of moralizing food, which then led to diet culture. And this perspective led to the classification of indigenous foods as inferior and incorrect. And they also, Europeans introduced new foods such as goats, sheep, cattle, horses, pigs, and some of these animals produce milk, and also there was an increase in dairy. Um, and this disrupted indigenous food systems and also banned and burned native crops for many reasons, to disconnect people from their land, their spiritual practice, and to literally starve them. And this caused ecological disbalance, leading to food insecurity. Also, Christianity enforced morals around food, surrounding purity. And that's where if you look at the clean eating movement, there's remnants of purity culture in there and diet culture. The enslavement, rape, and marrying of Native and African women and to spirits by Spanish men and European men also led to the fusion of Latin cuisine or soul food as we might know it of food from the South is all a product of this of this mix of violence and in the Chicanex, Chicano, Chicana um, realm, there's a lot of talk about the cosmic race, and I have an issue to that because there is a big oversight of who paid a price for this cosmic race, women. And so, um, the, well, the foods that we have today were heavily impacted by sexual violence, but nobody wants to talk about that. Also, starvation became a colonization tool. Many times, um, they would, when natives were forced into these um, reservations, the agents would not allow access to foods as a means for indigenous people to give up their lands. And they were pretty successful with that. And also, there's instances of destroying um, food, natural food and environments to push and native people into uh, reservations. And it was also, starvation was used as a way to disconnect indigenous people from their spiritualities as many foods were used for ceremonial purposes, completely distinct and away from diet culture today. But if we look at this plant, amaranth, it was banned for its ceremonial use. If anybody was found with even seeds, they would chop off their hands. Luckily, we still have this plant, um, but there's other plants that were banned as well. So how does all of this lead to eating disorders? Because the idea is, well, you know, white girls and women, the media, they want to be a certain size at the end. You just got to eat. That's maybe some of our understandings of eating disorders, but it's a lot more complex than that. Well, to begin with, eating disorders are creative, maladaptive ways of spiritual and psychological survivor. I forgot to mention earlier, but I am a person still living with an eating disorder. 
And just as it's been a bad thing for me, it's also the reason why I'm still here. And that's a mind bed right there. Because eating disorders serve a way to gain control, feel like you have control over something when you do not have any control outside of you. It is a way to conduct self-harm. And if we're seeing our environment being degraded, we've seen people that look like us be degraded and dehumanized, what are we going to do to ourselves but commit self-harm? Um, that's why harm reduction is so important. And also eating disorders have a numbing factor. And it's a way to escape. It's a way to unleash a lot of rage as well and unresolved grief. And for many people's an attempt to attain less oppression, for folks who engage in disordered eating as a means to try to control weight, many times it's because they want one less oppression in their plate. And so they are very creative ways that we have learned to survive. And I've always said disorder leads to disorder. And what we know about people that do make it into these treatment centers is that a large majority of them come from childhood trauma. So it's the onset of the development of eating disorders. It is a response to, to trauma. And what we know is that individuals who have family members with eating disorders are 7 to 12 times more likely to then develop one as well. And I just talked about a few incidences in history of food insecurity from the past. And now currently the food insecurity that we have now, and we can only imagine what that's going to do to future generations and why this work is so important. Now, semi-starvation has shown to trigger obsessive behavior around food, depression, and continue starvation cycles. And this is just a little that we know about eating disorders. So if there's multiple generations that experience food insecurity, what do we expect these generations to feel and experience? I come from on my mother's side of extreme food insecurity. My mother used to pick up orange peelings from the floor and gum as a child. So I slowly started to put the pieces together to understand why it is that I struggle with what I struggle with. Um, and having that information so valuable in understanding your role in generations as to how we heal this or get, at least get a little bit better. So eating disorders are historical trauma manifestations. They just don't happen just because, and they tend to happen in heavily patriarchal societies. Anytime patriarchy has increased, there's an increase of eating disorders. Um, the first incidences of anorexia were of of during a time where um, Catholicism and patriarchy were at the forefront and many women became even saints um, because of their ability to starve. And so when we speak about eating disorders, it's so important to expand the lens and be aware of how we are all in this cloud of diet culture, gym culture, white supremacy, anti-fatness, and um, just become more, more aware of how we talk about food, how we judge other people based on their size. And um, there's so much work that needs to, to happen within these, these topics. Um, if we still have time, let me see if I can pull these up. And there will be time for Q&A right after this as well. Can we give Gloria a round of applause?
why don't we do this? Why don't we take about a, a 10 minute break now? Is that fine? And then you'll be able to come back and Gloria will be able to you'll stay and take some questions before we jump into the panel. And then we'll have the panel with uh, Dr. Coakley and Dr. Crawford. Uh, so stretch and go out and get some food from uh, Dee's Catering. And we had two powerful presentations, so there's a lot to, to think about. And there's tables out there if you want to huddle together maybe and scribe out some questions as a group that would work real well. So let's see how it goes from there. But let's, uh, we've got 10 minutes from now. And we'll go from there. Gloria, thank you so much. <laughs> Reflections on what he heard uh, uh, Gloria talking about. Uh, and then Dr. Crawford will be managing that discussion up until it's time for uh, up until it's time for lunch. And you may have noticed out there that we have for lunch, we've got peach cobbler, uh, you know, got oxtails, lobster, uh, you know, yeah, onion soup, uh, all that type of stuff. No, we just got cold sandwiches. <laughs> Okay, thank everyone um, so much uh, that uh, Gloria Lucas uh, covered. Uh, I, I wish you could have, but maybe not, have heard the host conversation as people were grabbing snacks about your presentation. Very, very appreciative. We wanted to take maybe one at the most one and a half questions, uh, and then we'll go into the panel in the interest of time and what we've got set up. Is, is there a one question that we wanted to? You mentioned you had something, Javier, that you wanted to. Okay, good one. Is there someone who had one question they wanted to get out here based on what uh, uh, Gloria Lucas was saying? If not, we'll go right into the, we'll go right into the panel, okay? Why don't we, why don't we, yes, go right here. I was, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the mechanism by which um, you know, racial oppression and um, the, sorry, I'm struggling with words here. No words. <laughs> um, basically about, regarding what your presentation was about, how that leads into um, eating disorders, just that mechanism. Exactly. Sorry, repeat that one more time. Sure. Um, so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how, from your perspective, eating disorders come about through the um, intergenerational trauma that you spoke to, and maybe if you could a little bit about how we might be able to treat that. Mm. Got, it, got it. Yes. I mean. It's, it's a yarn ball that you, once you get one in, it just keeps more and more coming out. And I, I feel that every story is so different in every family. But nonetheless, you know, when I think about my own personal experience, I think about how, for once, I, for one, like my father's an indigenous man, but I've never even identified or saw the connection between that. And I think that's, that's cool. You know, there's a rhyme where you, I'm a Latina, I'm not indigenous, right? Like it's just, and there's so much um, moving going on with that and organizing and awareness, but and I think about my own experience, how race and migration impacted my worldviews and therefore impacted how I view myself and how at a very early age, anti-fatness 
really hindered my, my, my growth, my mental health. Um, and at the end of the day, all these things are, are connected because I think about my mother's experience, experiencing such, such high food insecurity, and she is entrenched in diet culture today. And um, on my father's side, I don't know, he does not talk too much about his childhood, um, but I couldn't really imagine what happened. And what his story is of the dark skinned man in the US, who's not from this of here, the US as we know it. Um, so, I, there are stories that have not been told in our families. And I think there's power in saying that to people. And that just because one develops an eating disorder is not a character. Wow, but to me, it's just a natural response to so much disorder. Of course, you're going to eat in a disorderly way. On top of messages of diet culture, my goodness, the thoughts that infest about food 300 years ago, 500 years ago, that really, those thoughts didn't exist. That it was just about how to, how to, how to how do I get the next meal for my tribe, my community, whatever? This, this is good food, this is bad food, this is gonna do this to me. It's just, it's just so much. But um, the intergenerational piece, it's, it passes through what mothers say about their, their kids' size, what dads say about their kids' size, uh, about moralizing food in the household. Um, that's one way that it gets passed on, and I think, I think five years ago they did a study, I believe, in, in, in Texas in which uh, they found that people who have binge eating disorder, the develop, why they develop it was because of food insecurity. Um, we've, I've been knowing that, we've been knowing that, but now there's proof, but there's so much knowledge, I think, that exists within People like myself who are not not necessarily in academia, but are in the, who are in the community role. But but yeah, I went all over the place with that. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but they, there's there's so many connections yet to be connected within our own families, and I didn't start putting that all together until I started doing this work. And if I weren't doing this work, I probably would have never made the connections. And I think for people who are in the mental health field giving that space for people to talk about their families, family stories, is so key in understanding who we are today. Um, the last thing I will say about that, and I, I made a, I was really reflecting upon that because my, my grandfather passed away in January, and my grandfather was 93. He was a man of the land. Like he knew how to grow food and humble man, and I like being indoors, so he spent it under a tree and he planted and left us fruit trees. And um, yesterday I was preparing the slides and actually one of the slides had a picture of a wamuchi, which is a fruit from the tree. And I started to think about, I have never really, had not thought about how many generations it took for me to become this aware. And there's intergenerational trauma, but there's also intergenerational wisdom. And um, I couldn't see that until he passed away. So I just wanted to share that. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Gloria. So we're going to bring up uh, Dr. Kevin Copley, Dr. Yashika Crawford, and Gloria Lucas, and they will be seated here. I think we're going to need one more chair here. Um, over here. Oh, you're, going to, you're going to come here. Okay. So, Dr. Kevin Copley, you met uh, yesterday, uh, he is the University of Diversity and Social Transformation Professor and Professor of Psychology at the University of Michigan, where he serves as an Associate Chair of Diversity Initiatives for the Department of Psychology. Uh, you may have heard yesterday that uh, he is now a member of the Emoji Equity Institute uh, and the Emoji Learning 
exciting uh, community. That's something that happened to him in the last day. So give him a round of applause. <laughs> You have heard uh, just from uh, uh, Gloria Lucas, uh, and she will be in conversation. We're going to start, I think, I'll, I'll let Dr. Crawford have a uh, Dr. Yashika Crawford, uh, who is here, uh, is a student rising above college and career advisor. She's a psychology instructor here at the College of Marin. She served in management positions in San Francisco Unified School District, Sloan College District, and the Peralta Community College District. Uh, she is a uh, proud attendee of Howard University and the HBCU, and he received her doctoral degree from the University of Florida. She is a member of the College of Marine Equity and Mental Health Team. She's a program developer with the Emotion Equity Institute and faculty team member of the Emotion Learning Community. And all of us who work on this project uh, know that. Uh, Yashika, uh, as we call her, Dr. Crawford, uh, is one of the key architects of what all of us have been building here uh, at the College of Marin uh, over the last uh, uh, several years. So we're very, very fortunate to have her, very blessed uh, to have her. Team, um, we thought it would be a really great opportunity, and one of the lessons we learned from last year's symposium is anytime we had an opportunity to engage and connect with each other, that is always uh, its own learning experience. And very seldom, when we have a multi day event of learning, do we have a chance to have two of our featured keynotes in the same space together having a QA with you. And so, this is really Centering you and our featured uh, panelists together, offering opportunities for you to ask questions. Um, and so we will have Anissa with a mic, we have Colleen with a mic, and we're going to float through the aisles. Um, we will have questions, but before we begin, sorry, I wanted to provide there were uh, some of our participants today weren't. Uh, present yesterday for Dr. Copley's presentation. So I wanted to provide opportunity for Dr. Copley. I wanted to provide opportunity for Dr. Copley to um, speak a little bit about uh, his research and work and also share any uh, alignment that he's seen with our presentations that he's experienced uh, being in college of Marin. Dr. Copley. Um, I was going to say Good morning. It's yes, still morning. Good morning. How's that work? Good morning. All right. So I'm just going to give a, a very brief um, review or overview of, of what I presented on yesterday. So um, we, we talked about this idea called the impossible phenomenon, which of course is the idea of individuals who are very accomplished, competent, and intelligent people who nevertheless feel like intellectual frauds. Uh, is the idea is that individuals have a individuals who feel like impostors have a difficult time truly accepting the fact that, that the accomplishments that they have achieved, they have truly earned and they are worthy of being acknowledged. And they feel like they are um, impostors, they feel like frauds. And the original context, of course, of that research was, I was just having a conversation um, with someone, the original, the original context for the uh, research was with white women, but in the work that I've done, I have examined the possibilities amongst minoritized individuals, and what I have um, been proposing for the last few years is that when you talk about minoritized individuals, it's really a racialized form of imposterism because it is often the case that when you are a minoritized individual in predominantly white spaces, that you are receiving messages from the environment that, that make you feel as though you don't belong, and those messages of, of, of feel like you don't belong, cause or sow seeds of doubt, oftentimes in minoritized individuals. And so you, in my opinion, you can't talk about impossibilities with minoritized individuals without addressing the very oppressive environmental circumstances under which they are navigating. And so that's a little bit about the work that I have done. And, and I, when I think about historical trauma, um, I can definitely see some connections to feel like impossible for minoritized individuals because 
we have we, we know that that we are constantly living in circumstances by which the, the present is impacted by the past. And when I think about educational historical trauma and the idea that for minority individuals, there have always been questions uh, about our deservedness to be in these places. We've constantly had to sort of address people who see us as being here only because of the color of our skin, uh, because we're simply fulfilling quotas, and, and we're always having to try to prove ourselves in ways that, that really impinge upon our mental health in unhealthy ways. And so for me, I see the historical trauma of the, the racism and oppression of educational systems as being an ongoing um, sort of factor that impacts the mental health of students of color and impacts the ways in which they have to struggle with and deal with the cost of good. So I clearly see some connection um, with historical trauma in the work that I do. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. And now the floor is open. As you think about your questions, also consider the through lines and the alignment between so much of what you've experienced these last uh, day or so. And uh, we'll put it up to our, our panelists for discussion and comments to you. So if there's anyone who has a question, please raise your hands. And we have uh, Anissa with the mic, as well as Colleen. And we see someone in the back. Thank you so much. Don't be shy. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mary Lisa, an advocate and um, owner of Care Marin, creating a resilient environment Marin, which is involved my mental illness. And my question is, okay, we talk you talked a lot about celebrities who describe their imposter imposter phenomena. Um, and you also talked about how at your workplace, some things you would do to help with addressing the feelings that you have when you, you know, you have to deal with imposter phenomena. But like from a social justice level, what can a person do within their work or community to try to help stop? So, so the question is, it, within using a, a social justice framework, what can an individual do to to stop imposter feelings? Is that an accurate paraphrase of the question? It, it's not because I'm trying to figure out like what a person can do. You, okay, you, you talked about ways they could deal with their feelings. Okay, um, talk to colleagues, talk to friends. That's a very kind of hurtful thing to have to deal with it every day. So what can it do to stop it in certain ways? So you'll recall that when we talked about strategies, we, we talked about both individual and institutional strategies. And, and I've been very intentional about that over the past few years. When I initially started doing this work and, and people would always ask, what can we do to, to deal with the possibilities? Um, I initially focused primarily on the individual strategies. Um, you know, I think one of the one of the criticisms of psychology as a discipline is that there's too much focus on the individual and not enough focus on on the environment and, and the environmental impact on, on individual behavior. And so, and I think that's a fair criticism. And, and there are areas of the psychology that that have gone um, beyond the focus on the individual to recognize the environmental and institutional impacts on, on behavior. And so that's why I, I attempted to talk about um, the institutional strategies that, that can be employed to address the possibility. Look, it's, I, I don't think the onus should be on, on individuals, particularly individuals who, who represent um, minoritized groups. The, the onus should not be on them to have to deal with their impossibilities or to quote unquote solve their impossibilities because the, the sources of those impossibilities is not from them. It's from what is from their experiences, it's from the messages, it's from the cues that they are, 
are receiving from the environment that they are responding to. And so I, I think I would, I would suggest that rather than sort of put an undue amount of focus on what the individual should do, and again, I can offer some strategies in that regard, but really the focus I would suggest should be more on what, how the environment should change so that individuals are not having to deal with these impossibilities. Because look, in my work with minority students, and I've been a professor now for 25 years or so, and I, at, at four different institutions, I have seen similar experiences for all minority individuals where they are always having to deal with people questioning their right to get an education and to be where they are. Um, before, I mean, now we, we know that affirmative action is, is no longer in place, but at the University of Texas at Austin, where I taught for, the, for 15 years, they used to have something called affirmative action bake sales. Are you all familiar with that? I don't know if they have it here in Texas, but affirmative action bake sales was a form of protest by a right-wing student organization where they would have students, um, you know, depending on what your, your social identity was, pay different prices for, for uh, baked, baked goods. So, so black folks and other, and black folks and other um, black and brown folks would pay the least amount for, for baked goods, uh, whereas white and students would pay the most. And so they, that was supposed to be a message about the supposed unfairness of affirmative action. Now imagine being a student of color and, and being on campus and, and having to be subjected to that sort of behavior and then having to hear a universal response that, well, it's, it's just freedom of speech, there's not a lot that we can do about it, they have the right to do that. And so they have the right to, to be so aggressively, um, aggressively racist um, against these students and these students have no recourse. And so, so for me, I, I can't just say, well look, these are the things that that individual student should do to change feeling like an imposter because of, you know, of the things that happen in the environment. No, the university should, it should, should react and respond in ways so that those sorts of um, so supposed free speech acts don't impinge on the right to be human and to feel a sense of deservingness that students of color, minoritized individuals, should be able to feel. So, let me just say this. I, I don't want to overly emphasize what the individual should do. And yes, I did describe, you know, you know, keep a list of record of accomplishments, um, you know, not you know, own your own your accomplishments. I mean, those, and those things are certainly important, but I don't think they are more important than ultimately changing the environment because it's the environment that's sick and it's the environment that's causing, in my estimation, causing students of color to, to struggle with these possibilities. And uh, I, I saw your, um, your, your, your line might have been turning a little bit. Uh, uh, Ms. Lucas, Lucas asked, uh, Kevin Kofi was talking about um, how the external influences the internal. Do you see some alignment with what he was sharing with your own work? I think for women of color, this comes up a lot, especially in academia or any type of field. I definitely have feel it from time to time. I'm in the eating disorder field, one of the most widest fields out there. Um, and what I thought about is, what was coming up for me is, my main rule is just show up. Like you could be insecure, you could doubt yourself, but the most important thing is that you show up. And I realized that anytime I show up in a space that was not designed for me, I give permission for other people. And that has really um, changed my mindset about where I am and how it is that I show up. And um, I feel there's so much internalization sometimes. And I really have a real moment with myself, and I say, I know I'm important, but this is, I'm, like, I'm not that important. The message is what's important here, and um, and so those are ways that have personally helped me when dealing with feeling like I, I 
I'm, I'm not smart enough. I, I don't speak well enough. My accent, how I look, my size, all of these things, right? I should not be here. And trust me, I, I feel them every time I go to an eating disorder conference. I know for sure I, I'm going to get a migraine. Like this field makes me sick, physically ill. And so for me, it's been, how do I best take care of myself in those circumstances and realizing that I might have all of this come up in these spaces when they show up and also having boundaries. I don't go to every eating disorder conference. I know, I know. And that's fine. That's completely fine, but um, I don't know if that answered your question, but I was just sharing what was coming up for me. Is there another question? There is, and I already had the mic, so put your hand in. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you both again for being here. My name is Lakeisha, and I have a question. It started out as a question for Dr. Coakley, but um, I would love it if uh, Ms. Lori could also uh, provide some feedback. My question is, as it relates to how I can best support or direct our students that I work, that I work with here at the um, as it relates to the impact of social media, right, it's so pervasive and immediate and so much of folks' identity these days is wrapped up in these curated facades. And so, you know, you can, some folks are seeking validation, you can get that, a hundred thousand people can uh, big up you right quick and also tear you down and cancel you in a moment's notice, whether it's regarding, you know, your, uh, intellectual capabilities, your successes, your weight, your aesthetic, all of that. So give me something that I can do to, to help support our students, because this is a difficult time to navigate. Appreciate y'all. How are you going to just drop that on me? Like that? <laughs> It, it, it is true that the impact of social media today is tremendous, tremendous for our, our students. Um, and and what, is, what is very true is that our students are much more um, social media savvy than, than those who are you know, perhaps my age. And so we find ourselves in positions where we have to learn from them. And in, in doing so, we can, we can see the corrosive impacts of, of that, that outlet. I mean, it, there's certainly some positive elements to it, but as you have suggested, there's a very corrosive element. Um, I, I will, this is what I can speak to, um, and that is part of how I'm engaged in social media is to, to address what I believe to be some of the, the dangerous information, the dangerous messages that you see more dangerous might be too hot to roll it some of the misinformation that you see spread on social media related to the work that I do. So let me give you just a quick example. Um, about three years ago, someone brought to my attention that there was a debate about the imposter phenomenon. And it started on TikTok, um, and then I think it spread to um, Twitter. I guess it's now called X, but it's still Twitter in my mind. Um, and the debate was around the origins of the term. And someone had, and it, it, was, it was on TikTok, someone suggested, someone had gone to a, a talk where a professor had stated that the imposter phenomenon was created as a term by white people to pathologize black women. And, and it spread like wildfire. There were like thousands of, of responses and likes and, and and someone brought it to my attention, and I was like, oh my, that's, that's just not true. That's, that's literally not true. Um, you know, you don't have to be a scholar to know, you know, if you just do a little reading, you'll see that that is not the origins of the term at all. And yet, it had, it had really, it had made its way throughout various social media outlets. And so, you know, I and other people have attempted to, to address it by, by becoming engaged in social media ourselves. Now, this, I know this is a little bit tangential to the question that you're asking, but, but it is important that we understand 
both the good and the not so good with social media and how it can be a portray a a how it can sort of perpetuate negative information, whether it's about a concept such as the imposter phenomenon or negative messages that students are internalizing and now um, we are seeing the results of that. You know, I don't know that I have a good answer to your question other than helping students to, to understand that there, there are ways that they can engage social media that, that can be healthy, but that there are ways that, that are, are really detrimental and, and it's, it's easier said than done. When I think about you know the students that I have, when I think about my my children, uh, they all sort of consume these these social media uh, outlets, and I think it's just the only thing that I can say is that we have to help them learn how to navigate these spaces in ways that that don't damage their self esteem, and to help them understand that look, everything that's being said on social media. It's not healthy. It's kind of like TV, right? Like you know, or any you know sort of you know media. You don't too much of something can be really really bad, particularly when there's no regulation of the messages and the content. And we know that in this sort of anti-regulation sort of you know culture that we're in, regarding you know he's the, the current owner of um, Twitter slash X, for example, who does not believe regulation. Because there's no regulation then we have to be much more intentional in helping students understand that everything that's in these spaces is not healthy and, in fact, you probably should not be consuming because it's bad for your mental and physical health. Um, and I'm sorry that I don't have a better answer for you, but it's, it's, it's a difficult question. Social media outlets where you know they are um, working 
through the algorithm, the types of things that they consume will result in additional types of, similar types of uh, material. So I would just encourage people and encourage students to be very, very careful about what they're consuming because once you start consuming some of that negativity, it starts to, to dominate the type of things that you are exposed to. I know too, I'm always giving shout out to Emily because I talk about eating disorders. And they send me the pop up, hey, are you okay? Here's some resource. I'm like, <laughs> too little, too late, but, but yes. Uh, but yeah, they, it always happens, and uh, I have some things I have to say about that. I've heard that term before, shadow bag. I, I'm not on social media, so what is that? What happens when you're shadow bag? Some people say it's real, some people say it's not real. I think it's real. Is Trigger words, it lowers your views okay. and engagement. Okay. Uh, and if I, I got my account removed back to back last two December's ago. I got, I got it removed because so many people would report my post of people who are in larger sizes. Um, and also another thing that I, I remember now that I was going to say, also the hashtag harm reduction is. I think it's banned on Instagram, so even when I speak about harm reduction for drug use, it's uncut. So I'm just like, it's a mess. And I, on TikTok, I don't think you could so clearly say eating disorder, which I think I understand why, but it also doesn't allow for proper awareness to take place, and there's no conversations about it. And I think that's just as bad. So, but that's a whole other conversation. But yeah, Instagram, I go back and forth with them all the time with me because of what I cover. If I say eating disorder too much, my engagement goes down. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to share some love for folks in the in the center here. Uh, were there any questions? Uh, uh, Javier? Uh, hi guys, um, so my name is Javier Bicuna. Um, I work over at the Multicultural Center of Marin, and I'm the studio manager there. Um, I just, more more so I wanted to comment more on, on Gloria, specifically your um, presentation. Um, I think that the, the conversation of eating disorder just wasn't present when I was a, when I was a kid, because I grew up in a Latino family, so as a kid, I can remember not eating very much, and that made like my parents worry, but they weren't like, they didn't know the concept of eating disorder. Um, so what they would do is they would just have me eat more because I was so skinny when I was a kid. And that really ended up screwing me up because as, as I was growing up, I was eating like, and again, we were also, you know, we were very low income, so the only things we could afford was like Burger King, McDonald's, you know, all the junk food. So, you know, I was eating more of that, and it got me big, but then it got me fat. It got me really, really fat. And um, then then all of a sudden, my parents turned on me and were like, why are you so fat? <laughs> why, why did you get so big? It's like, it's, it's so hard, um, again, having that conversation because it's just that that concept is so they, they don't know that concept. So, um, like I said, I'm a first generation here in the United States, and my my parents were you know working all the time, and, and it's really hard. Um, I get to have those conversations with them because they're not there all the time. Um, but I remember when I got to high school, um, I started doing sports. I started doing more of that, and I started losing a lot of weight that way. But what I realized, and I'm now realizing now, is I was I was the skinniest I had ever been in high school, like my junior and, and my, my junior and my senior year. But that was also the most depressed I had been in my entire life. Like that was the most depressed I had ever felt. Looking back at it now, and again, my parents were happy. My parents were happy that oh look, you look so much better now. But it's like. I was going through so much other depressive type of mental health issues at that time that I was like, you guys might think I look 
great, but internally I'm not great at all, you know? Um, so it's just always been an ongoing issue, unfortunately, and it's just, it's, it's something that I hope that when, when I start a family that I want to teach my children to not, to not, again, not to impose those kind of, because again, it, it gets really complicated. It starts to get really complicated. And again, I don't want to enforce or like, force my children to ever do what my parents ended up unfortunately doing to me. Because again, like now in my 20s, um, what I've realized is that now, since I have the freedom, right, to kind of go anywhere, eat whatever I want, um, I don't, I just kind of naturally just eat now, and I feel so much happier, I feel so much more better, like my mental health is like at the best it's ever been, but it's just, again, it's just every now and then, you know, I'll go visit my, my parents, and they'll be like, my mom will be like, no, you gained a little bit of weight over, over the summer, I'm like, yeah, man, like, you know, it's just, it always turns into things like that. They're always like just nitpicking, you know, little things like that. So again, it's just, I don't know. Um, it, it's just something I want to comment on. And again, I'm, I'm really, really grateful that you're, you're making this conversation, you know, so much bigger and, and continuing to do this type of work. Because it's really, really important. And again, I, again, in Latino families especially, I don't think it's talked about enough. Uh, mental health in general isn't talked about enough. Um, but yeah, I just really wanted to thank you for, for a really great presentation. I just wanted to add that. Thank you for your comments. Can I see the uh, second hand up? Oh. I actually did want to respond um, briefly before going to the next question. Oh. Um, but I, I did want to recognize and honor your vulnerability in sharing that. and. Talking about food in immigrant households, oh my god. <laughs> I can't. It's so much in there because, especially they've been Americanized, and there's a, a, a whole other layer. And yeah, I, I totally hear you on the mixed message, especially so early in your life. It, it, when you're young, you're so impressionable, and your parents are doing this thing, and then they come with the stress of like there's not enough, especially if you come from a low income background. So when people are when people are low income, you have no other option but to eat disorderly. Like you will have disordered eating. Some people don't have the luxury of I knowing when the next meal comes, and there's so much shame in that. But people have to do what they have to do to survive. And there's so much shame in, in these um, in these types of foods are these very fast foods and all of that, but we forget to realize that's the only food for certain families. It's either that or nothing else. And so I feel like we have to be more careful in how we class shame when it comes to food because there's a lot of ignorance when, when it comes to that. Um, and I can tell you, having lived in the food desert area, well, I, uh, they're not calling it food desert. So someone from the desert actually corrected me and said they're called food prison, prisons. Um, and having, I, I used to live in Compton, that southeast LA area, people don't realize it's so hard to get fresh food there. I had no other option, especially if you didn't have access to a kitchen, you have no other option but to eat that type of food. And guess what? You have to do what you gotta do to eat and survive. And there's no shame in that. As I, I really, I wanted to say that. Um, and at the same time, what you brought up about, while people might have been commenting about being an ideal size, you felt at your worst. And I, it's true. Restriction, any eating disorder, impacts every system in your in your body, your brain, your hormones your bones, everything. Um, so many times when we are making comments to, to people of, oh my God, you're looking good, what are you doing? I will literally tell them, I have an eating disorder. That's what's going on. They wouldn't know what to say. Uh, a lot of people have autoimmune disorders. They don't have access to food, stress, depression. 
So we really have to be careful when we're trying to glorify body change. For me, when somebody's bo uh, body changes, especially in reduction, I need to check in with that person. Like, hey, and especially if someone I have a relationship with, like, are you, are you, are you okay? Is everything okay? Um, because for me, when I start to shrink, it's even disorder related. But yeah, everybody was a body me. And this year I'm going through my own nutritional rehabilitation. And talking about treatment is a whole nother conversation in this country. Um, so ultimately, for a lot of people who want to get better, so that you, you have other options to do it yourself. And I don't recommend that, it's dangerous. But uh, anyways, another conversation. And I can tell you this, eating disorders with food restrictions serves a purpose. It's, it's anesthesia. Because you literally compromise every system in your body. So then your body's in survival mode. Your cortisol levels go up. My awareness of the world is so limited when I'm deep within my disordered eating. I have no, by five o'clock, I'm, I'm done. I have no energy. And it's not until this nutritional rehabilitation period that I'm on right now, that from one day to the other, I just felt aware. And I couldn't have that when I was at the smaller body, looking better, blah, 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 having more access to clothes. Like I didn't have that then. Now I, I feel like this awareness. And so I just wanted to share that um, about not feeling so good when you're restricting. Because our bodies are not meant to restrict. Your body cannot differentiate if you're dieting or if it's environmental um, insecurities. So your body will respond. And this whole, um, your hormones, leptin levels increase. So you retain more calories because your body's like, we don't know when this is what you're going to eat, so we got to keep every uh, calorie, your metabolism slows down, and sometimes if you chronically diet, it's permanent. Like your body, your body will just continue to um, burn its calories during your resting phase. Anyway, this is, there's so much up, up in there, but, but just encouraging people to be more aware when commenting about people's bodies. You don't know what they're going through. And if you do have that type of relationship with them, ask them, is everything okay? What do you need? And maybe mentioning, I noticed that your side is changing. And maybe not saying the positive thing, because that was so bad for me at that time. Are there any other? Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, my name is Catherine. I work with um, high school as a school therapist. And Every time someone asks a question, I change what I want to ask because it's just so fascinating and so many things I'd like to know. Um, so perhaps just off the back of what you just said, that having moved to this country a few years ago, I became so aware about how much kind of cultural normality there is around commenting on what you look like. And people who I don't know commenting on my hair or my body shape or whatever it might be, which I kind of felt was different from what I'd experienced in the UK. Um, and so really I wanted to challenge everyone to see if we could all get through the next week without commenting about how somebody looks and see how we do. Because we have to bring awareness that it's not okay to keep doing that. So thank you both, it's been fascinating listening. So much. I think we have time for just one more question. Uh, we have up, up here. Come. Hello, my name is Jasmine. Um, my question. I want to know how you guys have both built up the courage 
um, to reconcile within your own heart, to be able to speak to white people about the atrocities rooted in white supremacy and how that's had wrong effects on people of color. Working in environments where it was dominated by whiteness, medical treatments, and being told that it's all in your mind, how are you able to, without vitriol, be able to speak and to do it with such ease and grace without having such a, I guess, an internal warfare that could disrupt your ministry to some degree? Um, yeah, Thank you for the question. Um, my, my approach has always been to talk about systems, to talk about cultures, to talk about systems. I, you know, so when I, so for example, I, you know, I talk classes on, on multicultural counseling <clears throat> for a number of years, and, and in those classes, we directly address and, and talk about the very things that you're talking about, and you know, you know, white supremacy, um, all forms of oppression, and and I've been pretty successful at doing that. And I, it, not to toot my own horn, but but I have been a recipient of a number of teaching awards, and and part of what I tell people is that, that when I teach, I do so in a way. That that does not alienate white folks. Uh, I can talk about white supremacy. I can talk about historical trauma. I can talk about racism and sexism and homophobia and trans. I can talk about all these these forms of isms and phobias, and do so in a way that's that's matter of fact, that's not blaming, but it, but that just it just says, look, this this is the historical reality. This is the contemporary reality. What are we going to do about it? No, I don't care who you are. No one wants to be in a space where they're browbeat to the point where they no longer want to be a part of the solution. Uh, and I and I have colleagues, you know, other fellow social justice, you know, warriors as we like to call them, who use a very different approach, and and the results are, are quite different. Um, you know, they they see very negative course evaluations. They are attacked, and, and I, you know, I don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, in the social media sphere, you know, I've I've done a lot of public scholarship, and I have certainly received my share of, of really nasty emails. And that, that I, mean, I a couple of years ago, I just to give you an example, I wrote uh, a piece for USA Today uh, around uh, critical race theory. Um, I received a lot of negative emails about that. Um, during the height of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, USA Today asked me to write a piece, and I and I wrote about Black Lives Matter. You know, you know the whole spiel about it doesn't we're not saying that the other lives don't matter. It's that whole sort of discourse. Uh, and I'll never forget the very next day as I was looking at my email, I, I had an email from an individual who, who did not try to mask his identity, and the only thing that it said was the N word written 156 times. I know because I counted each one. And so I have I have been on the receiving end of, of vitriol because of the, of the work that I've done. And you know that it's it's part of course that those things are going to happen. But but in my but I in my own sort of teaching and in my sort of outreach and in my social justice work, I make it a point of not attacking. I don't <clears throat> I don't try to make white people feel bad about themselves. I think history does that by itself. And they don't need me to, to pile on. But all I but, but but I'm inviting them to allyship. I'm inviting them to join us in this fight against these forms of oppression. So that's always been my approach, and it's been relatively successful. Um, I've always seen my role as a disruptor. And I realize that it doesn't matter how much I assimilate, if I remove my accent, my size, my existence will always be a problem. And so my responsibility is to share my truth. And I don't want to compromise that. 
That being said, like I, sh I shared earlier, I'm in a very white field, and it has taken a toll on me. It has. And the only way I can do this work is to have very firm boundaries. I am not accessible to everybody. I'm not, and by that I mean I, my priority is BIPOC people, and that's how I've been able to stay as sane as possible. Um, so I've had to put those very firm boundaries of white women want a lot of, a lot of extraction from me. I am not a coal mine, and I always have to remind myself, and I always tell myself, every indigenous woman carries serpents in her skirt. That's always stayed with me. Um, and I got that from one of the um, goddesses in my dad's side of lineage. Um, she carries serpents in her, in her skirt. And I didn't understand that. But now I, I get it. Anybody that tries to attack me or is in proximity to harm me. So I, every day I try to go to bed with the conscious, being aware that I did not bite my tongue when I should have said something. And I could say I, I have failed sometimes. I think we all do. But I, I'm not here for the comfort of whiteness. That defeats what, I, what I'm doing. Um, and yeah, I've received death threats, for sure, because of the work that I do. Um, I'm not hireable by eating disorder companies, because I'm the ticky bomb, according to them. <laughs> and I realize that if I don't upset somebody, then maybe I'm not doing my job right. And with that being said, there's days where I have a whole lot of compassion for everybody. And there's other days where I'm hurt. And it's not the day for that. So I, I don't think I have the answer or the right formula, but this is so far what I've done to make it this way because of course people would much rather see starving activists of course, people would much rather see a woman of color in the bottom. And so I, I might as well just share my truth. And it's okay if people are upset. I always upset people. Always. It just comes with the territory. And I know my mom and dad have to bite their tongue a lot. They did that so I wouldn't have to. And I always remember that too. Please give your
come on down if you're if you're uh, if you're willing to come kind of down and join us so we can have a really nice nice discussion. Um, it would be great to have you kind of closer in. Um, so I have the, the privilege of introducing Dr. Moon Lansing. Um, and this is a moment in particular where we're feeling very sad to miss Dr. Stormy Miller, who wasn't able to be here, um, because apparently I am now learning that her and Joshua know each other from college in Alabama, and I'm, I'm quite bummed she's not here, because I, I do think we could get some better stories than I might be able to kind of introduce with um, about Joshua, but maybe also about Stormy. So, so it's a loss, a loss for us, um, but we're so happy that you're here. Uh, so Dr. Joshua Moon Johnson is an author, educator, and activist. Currently the Vice President of Student Services of the College of Marin San Mateo. Joshua received a doctorate in education and a certificate in LGBTQ studies from Northern Illinois University and is the author of, is it four books? All right, four books, including the best-selling, um, here it is, Beyond Surviving from Religious Oppression to Queer Activism. And Joshua's newest book um, just came out last year, Queer and Trans Advocacy in the Community College. So I don't know, it sounds like pretty relevant to, to our work here. We're so happy to have you, and we'll be raffling off some autograph books for, um, soon. So thank you, and we'll let you take it away. Hello. Hi, y'all. How's it going? Um, excited to be here with y'all. Um, as Dula said, uh, I knew Dr. Stormy Miller from the University of Alabama, Girl Tad. Um, and so you will hear me saying y'all quite a bit up here as well. Um, who do we have here in the house? Any of our faculty here today? Yeah, okay, faculty. Thank you for being here. Any of our staff? Yes, administrators? Any students? Woo! Woo! Students, thank you. Y'all know y'all come down here. I, I promise I won't spit that much at y'all. <laughs> so, oh, thank you. Stay where you already need to be. Uh, any of our community partners? No? Okay, yes, a couple of our community partners here. Thank you for being here as well and collaborating on this wonderful symposium. So I'm excited to be here with you today. We have about 45, 50 minutes together to really get into some conversations. Uh, and then we'll definitely have some time at the end for questions with that as well. Um, I am from the South, but I do speak kind of quickly, and so if I am going too fast, please just kind of tell me, slow it down. Um, I'm also a pretty um, interactive presenter, speaker, so if you would rather me, um, if you have questions or need clarification, I'm completely comfortable with you raising your hand and interrupting, but also we'll have some time at the end for specifically dedicated time for Q&A. Cool. So, uh, well, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, and as we really get into this conversation, specifically this conference around equity, I think it's critical that we think about what equity means historically and also current day with that as well. Um, any conversation, especially in higher education, that we're talking about equity, um, I want to be intentional to think about where our college campuses are built. Um, and this probably applies to some of our nonprofit and community partners as well, where your uh, area is built on too. Um, higher education, we often talk about land-grant institutions, but knowing that land that was granted was stolen land uh, based off of genocide and colonization. And so as we think about that today, I want to intentionally name and honor the original caretakers of this land and the tribal people of the Coast of Miwok. In addition to uh, naming them verbally and in writing, it's also critical that specifically this college think about what is that relationship with the current day Coast Miwok people, um, what is their access to this institution, how is this institution serving and supporting them, empowering them for their own economic development with that as well. I know many of our institutions and organizations have moved to having land acknowledgments, but I hope that that is the beginning of a conversation and a journey, and not the end of that as well. And I will leave that with all of y'all as a challenge to put that into action um, as y'all move into a new academic year. Uh, with that, uh, so today I want us to think about why we're here and what this topic might have to do with equity and with mental health. Um, so for the next hour or so, I get to talk to you about all kinds of gay stuff, Gay, 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 trans, 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 drag, and even drag queens, drag kings, all these things. 
And I say this intentionally to rub it in the face to all those folks in Florida, Georgia, Texas, Tennessee, mostly all the folks that I came from, y'all. Um, but with that, this is political. This is focused on justice with that as well. And this directly impacts the curriculum that we're talking about within our colleges and higher education, our K-12 systems, that we will intentionally name those in our places of education. And I know that we are here in California. We often think of California as the land of progress and inclusion. I know coming from Mississippi, when I came to California, I thought I had made it, and this was the place that I was going to belong and succeed. Um, then I didn't realize that some of the isms that we're talking about today exist everywhere, even in California even in the Bay Area. So today, I hope that we can, yes, recognize where we are, but also take a deeper dive and say that we still have a long way to go as we think about serving our LGBTQQIAAPK2S populations. Did everybody get all those letters? Does everybody name all those letters too? So I did intentionally name all of those, and even with that, I'm sure I left out some sub-communities and some populations with that too. Um, I have my doctorate in LGBT studies, I've been doing research, writing, and speaking on LGBTQ plus issues since probably about 2005. I am still learning, and I am still unlearning with that as well. So I do that to say, like, we all are here as lifelong learners to really unpack and discuss how we're better serving the queer and trans community. So for the next part of this talk, I might use the terms lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, two-spirit, intersex, or asexual, or LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus, or just queer and trans moving forward. And I will explain some of that in a little bit, uh, but some of this you'll need to um, think about, and some of it you might have to pull out your phone and Google yourself. Uh, almost all of y'all here in this room are educators or are students who are being educated, that I am giving you the um, ability to own your own learning and not always to make those folks from those communities teach you. So if I say something, Google it first, can't find it, definitely happy to answer and clarify with that as well. So if you're wondering why I'm here, talk about some topics that don't mean seem like they are super relevant to education or mental health or community practice or administration or even community colleges, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, but I also know that this is really highly relevant work to our practitioners, our faculty, staff, our students, uh, our administrators, for sure. But most importantly for all of us as humans, all of us as community members, that we exist in this community in the county of Marin. I first came into LGBTQ plus advocacy work from an evangelical Christian community perspective that I knew was very directly anti-LGBTQ. Um, and I'm aware that possibly there are some folks in this audience today who may be still struggling of how to advocate for LGBTQ LGBTQ plus people um, while also trying to hold their religious and spiritual beliefs. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to stay engaged, uh, to keep listening, uh, to hold all of those counter arguments that you might have, just hold them, and then be with us here today too. And as you go home today, I ask that you process them, you think about them, you research those ideas and questions, and even you can pray about them. You can pray about how these ideas that might contradict uh, some of the things you feel like you hold as your core beliefs, um, how those go with or against God's love. And I know that these comments are probably pretty uh, specific um, to very Christian-centric places as well, uh, but also there are other religious and spiritual practices that also um, have anti-LGBTQ or not also intentionally inclusive of LGBTQ plus people too. So I extend that to all of you as well. And so if you feel so moved, please say amen. <laughs> Oh, I got a couple of minutes up there, y'all. <laughs> um, <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, but before I do go too far, um, I'm going to give you all the chance to ask questions today. I know that many folks have questions about gender and sexuality, and oftentimes you don't have a place to ask them to. It may be intimidating. It may feel too sensitive for that as well. Also, if you do keep asking that one gay friend that you have or that one lesbian friend that you have the same question over and over, they're probably going to stop being your friend. And so I'm here today as someone who is paid to be an LGBTQ educator and professional, so I am that person that you're allowed to ask these questions to in a space like this where I am being compensated to be an LGBTQ educator. Many people might say I'm here as gay for pay. <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. Maybe I did. 
Um, anyway, what I really mean is oftentimes we put marginalized communities and minoritized communities as people who are expected to be our educators. I was once doing this uh, workshop around kind of whiteness uh, and race, and a group of um, white women told me it was the responsibility of their colleagues of color to educate them about race and racism, because how are they supposed to know? And so these ability to put it onto other people who are often the lived experience to be those educators, it's problematic and it's not always their job to do that as well. So I'm gonna ask you to use this space to engage in learning and also to be okay being vulnerable with that as well. So I ask, um, I'm here and I'm gonna share a little bit more about the LGBTQ plus experience specifically for students in higher education but also in community and community organizations. Throughout this talk, I'll use some of my experiences as an educator, administrator, uh, nonprofit board member, as well as a student when I was in college and university. My first actually full-time um, job as an equity uh, professional was as the director of an LGBT center at the University of California, Santa Barbara. So as I plan for today's talk, um, I reflected on my own academic, my career, and my own identity development journey. Um, you may see me up here as very confident and poised uh, and professional as a speaker and educator and writer. Um, however, as I reflect back on my own experience as a college student, as a queer, femme, gender non-conforming student who was, grew up living in poverty and who was homeschooled by Pentecostal evangelical parents in a small town in Mississippi, you might expect my journey faced some obstacles. So many times when we talk about equity, it's often an us versus them type of mentality. Um, especially as we think about the folks who are in this room as community college educators, as community practitioners, and mental health providers, we often view ourselves as we're the good ones. Um, but today, um, I'm not really worrying about those outside of this room. I want us to think about us. I want this to be kind of like a home talk. And I know we have a couple of guests in here who are community partners, but by and large, let's let this be a family. So think about this today as an invitation to a family meeting. So pull up your chairs, have a seat. Y'all, we're going to have some real talk, okay? We're ready for that? I see some head nods. We're ready for that, okay? Um, so if I push your buttons a little bit today, um, it's because I love you, and I love you enough to not let you stay the way you are. Giving critical feedback is hard. It's hard for that person to give that feedback as well. One of my close friends always says that feedback is a gift. And sometimes you can tell your friend, I have a gift for you, and it's feedback. As we think about how us as individuals, as well as us as organizations and institutions grow, it's often by accountability. I want us to view accountability as a form of love. Holding someone accountable is an act of love, and it's not always easy. So I invite that into this space today, and it's for all to think about what that means. Oftentimes, people who are anti-LGBTQ are seen as hateful, as ignorant, or bad in some ways. Um, and I believe that most people, specifically thinking about the type of folks who are here in this room, um, are people here who want to do good, who want to serve and support others. That's why you chose a profession to work in a community college or a nonprofit or in mental health services. So besides all that, if people do get wrong, if people do have ideas, beliefs, or actions that are anti-LGBTQ, um, I'm not here to um, assume that they're bad or that they're ignorant or that they're stupid. Um, I believe that we're all here, and oftentimes the people who are the most anti-LGBTQ are acting out of their own trauma, they're acting out of their own insecurities, and that's where those spaces are coming up as well. So when I interact with folks who are anti-LGBTQ, I hope that I can extend love and grace and patience to people whose ideas and beliefs are very different than mine and different than how I view myself as a person, as a human society. So thinking about my own journey into college, into as an educator, as an administrator, um, like many of the students here at the college of Marin, um, I struggled to find a place to belong on a college campus. Um, as a low-income, first-generation college student who was Asian-American, multiracial in Alabama, I struggled to feel included and understand the institutional culture. And on top of that, I felt shamed and fearful of violence because of my gender expression. And I had an internal battle with my own sexual orientation. My greatest fear was being outed, ostracized, attacked, and disowned. These all had impacts on my well-being, as well as my mental health and my ability to succeed as a student. I did find ways to succeed, and I became a 4.0 student and a very active student leader. And I hated so many moments of my college experience, 
even though I was the tour guide, I was the student body leader, I was the president of many student clubs, get, being in that space was still really difficult for me. Starting my very first semester of college, I would go to the library to try to find schools and schools and cities that I thought that I would be able to better accept me, to acknowledge me, to protect me, and to keep me safe. Um, as I found schools that I knew that I could easily get into, that I could go away and not always have to be in a rural southern place, I would realize that I would never be able to afford those spaces because I was on a full scholarship and on a financial aid package. When a college community has a specific program or services or spaces for LGBTQ plus students, um, that offers them a sense of belonging. Almost all of our students in the community college, um, they have challenges along their journey. However, LGBTQ plus students, they often face additional challenges, but with no sense of community or often very little support to guide them. So now that we know a little bit more about me and why I'm here, um, I'm gonna want us to jump into some content. Uh, and so I know like many of the Pentecostal ministers that I grew up with, um, I have some notes and I may or may not use them. So <laughs> let's see where the Holy Spirit takes me today, okay? Before I get too far into some of the kind of research and practice, I want us to let set a little bit of a foundation. Um, Y'all look like a really smart group, so I'm not going to go too far into this, um, I, but I do want us to give at least a basic terminology as we think about what are we actually talking about, so as I present some research and some practice, we all have a little bit of an idea of at least what I'm trying to say to you as well. So, to do that, I want us to introduce our little gender-neutral unicorn. Have people seen this before? No, okay, so a few people have. I love this little one. Um, and so, uh, one of my favorite things to do is to come up with gender inclusive names. Who has a favorite gender neutral name for a little unicorn? Terry. Terry, okay, so this is Terry, our purple gender neutral unicorn. And so I wanna just share a few little nuggets. This is not gonna be a full class session, but I want us just to talk about what it is that we're actually talking about. So, couple of little basic things here. I'm actually going to start with three, because I think that that's often where people get confused the most. So three, this is the physical parts of one's body, their chromosomes. So this is sex, or sex assigned at birth, is what we would often say with that as well. Um, when we talk about this, male and female. I think most people know what that is. Do I need to explain that to anybody? No, we're good. Okay, intersex. Intersex is something else that often when we don't talk about when we talk about sex or sex assigned at birth. Intersex is actually a combination of male and female reproductive organs. Um, many people think of that as like this unicorn, like it's rare, it's up there, it's really not that common. Realistically, it's about one in every 1,500 live births. That is the same ratio in the United States of being born with red hair. How many people know someone with red hair? I mean like real red hair, not dyed red hair. Okay, <laughs> you may have no idea. Anyway, if you know someone with red hair, or if you pass three people today with red hair, you also probably know someone who has an intersex condition, and or who is intersex that you pass on a regular basis. So we often say like, oh, it's, you know, it's biological, it's men and women, or male and female. Well, biologically, that's not actually that accurate with that as well. So that's what we're talking about with sex or sex assigned at birth. I'm gonna move from there to number two, gender expression. So I think most people are pretty okay with masculinity and femininity. When I think about masculinity and femininity, it's a combination of things. One, it can be physical body type. So your body size, hairy, uh, voice, face shape, all of those things kind of contribute to societally what we say now could be masculine or feminine. Additionally, it could be things like how you present your clothes. So where, what kind of clothes are you wearing? Do you wear jewelry? Do you wear makeup? All these kind of things are aspects of masculinity and femininity. It also could be things are like mannerisms. Um, it could also be interest and personality often get categorized as masculine and feminine. Within that, that's a spectrum. Most people are a spectrum there as well. And then we think about things like androgyny or fluidity with that as well. So moving from there, oftentimes the challenge in society is you are, let's say, born, male assigned at birth, male body parts, and then you express your gender, let's say, um, feminine. Then we would say that person is probably gender non-conforming. And so with that, we often in society assume that if you're born and you're male assigned at birth, you must be masculine, you must identify as a man or a boy. So when we go to uh, number one, gender identity, this is one's own self-identity, how to identify and it has nothing to do with their body parts, it has nothing to do with their gender expression actually either either. So here we often say man and woman, or boy and girl, which most people are pretty comfortable with. 
Uh, a term that some people may not be super familiar with, cisgender. This is really just saying in society, if you're born, you're male assigned at birth, and you identify as a man, then that you would be cisgender versus transgender. And we use the term cisgender versus saying like, oh, there's transgender people, then there's normal people. We want to avoid language like that. It's cisgender or transgender. When we talk about transgender, also something that is very common is non-binary, which is often something that is under the umbrella of transgender. And this is really saying that this clear like uh, binary of man and woman or boy and girl, it doesn't really make sense to me. It's not how I view myself. I don't fit in that. I identify as non-binary as neither of those. But that's often considered the transition of gender from birth, so transgender with that as well. And then lastly, number four, that kind of those little heart things. This is who do you want to be um, intimate with, emotionally attached to? Who do you possibly want to file your taxes with? Uh, this is sexual orientation is what we're thinking about here as well. And so sexual orientation is separate from all those other things. If you're a female person who is masculine, that does not mean that you're going to be a lesbian. That they're not the same thing. They're not connected. But we often uh, correlate and conflate those things. And so those are kind of the basics. When we talk about sort of sexual orientation, gay, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, queer, asexual, um, oh yeah, heterosexual too, that's one of those. Um, that's how most of us probably got here. <laughs> and so that's what we're talking about when we say sexual orientation. Thumbs up, we're good? Okay, any questions? Oh, yes, is that a hand up there? I can't tell. No. No. Oh, video recording. Okay, hi. <laughs> so, okay, we are going to keep going for the sake of time. Okay, so now that you know a little bit more um, about some of the basics and terminology around gender and sexuality, we can get to come to some of the core things that we want to talk about today. Um, one of the things that often comes up when we say these topics, whether you're a public health practitioner or an educator in a classroom or administrator, is when we start talking about these topics, people want to know, like, okay, well, how many LGBT students do we even have? Or how many LGBT clients do we actually have? Or whatever that population might be. Which is a really challenging question to answer. And I'd say most of the time, we don't even have accurate data at our institutions or in our counties or in our cities or even our state. Um, when I was the director of an LGBT center at a university, um, I would often propose like new funding, new programs, new staffing models, and the chancellor would always say, well, how many LGBT students do we even have? And then I would say, oh, also, can we collect this data at applications, admissions, research? Oh, that's too sensitive. You can't ask those questions. <laughs> so it's this kind of like cyclical thing of like never giving me the data, but also not giving us the resources because we didn't have the data. Our community college folks in the room know that we always say that we're data-driven. Um, however, I do want to question folks, if whose data is this? And so when you don't collect the data, or you don't collect the data accurately, how can we truly say that we're data-driven in our decision-making? And so that's a challenge that we're still facing within the California Community College. Um, and so oftentimes, if it's something you care about, you collect it. You understand who that population is, and you understand what their experience is at their institutions as well. So, with that, as my chancellor would always say, well, how many LGBT students do we have? And then he would not let me collect that data. I was like, okay, well, what do you really want me to do? I'm like, okay, I was going through the parking lot, and I saw six women get out of Subarus. Hmm, lesbians. <laughs> They're like, oh, okay, I saw these three poly male people wearing Taylor Swift t-shirts. Gay. <laughs> then I saw this one woman with half of her head shaved. New lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, y'all. I saw y'all laughing. Anyone who laughed? No, it. <laughs> I'm kidding. And if you tell anybody I said these jokes, I will deny them for sure. Anyway, obviously those are all stereotypes. Um, it's okay to laugh at them sometimes, but most of that is very untrue with it as well. But I just make fun of that and poke at it because of some of the nonsense ways in which we run organizations, major universities, um, health practitioner things, where we ask these questions when we know there's no answer to them. Um, but with that, as we think about data, I'm specifically talking about LGBTQ plus students right now, or community members. I also want to acknowledge there's other limitations that we often have with data in public health and community colleges. Think about the number of undocumented students or DACA students that we have, often a gap there as well. Think about our Arab and Middle Eastern students often get lost in the racial aspects of our data. As well as Southeast Asian students who are often not disaggregated from other Asian and Asian Pacific Islander communities with that too. So as we talk about being data driven, I want to make sure that we're being critical of the systems in which we're getting our data from too. 
However, whenever I have limitations with getting data, uh, one of the first things I do is go to find other empirical research. Just to give us a little bit of context, uh, if we don't have data at our own organization or our own college, there is data out there. We have many brilliant researchers who are gathering this information for us, and we can use empirical data to make decisions at our own organizations and institutions. A few little things to give you a snapshot that there actually are people at your campuses and organizations. Uh, about 19 million Americans, which is 8.2%, report that they have engaged in same-sex sexual behavior, and nearly 11% report same-sex sexual attraction. So, you know, 8 to 11% of folks are probably gay, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, in some way with that as well. Thinking about our four-year universities, we do have some data there. Um, it indicates about 17% of students identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, asexual, or queer. Um, and about 2% identify as trans or non-binary or questioning their gender. There's also an increase in with young people, knowing that Gen Z, about 18% identify as queer, and about 4 identify on the trans spectrum. And then more specifically here in California, this is a statistic from the UCLA Williams Institute, which is their law school research that specifically focuses on research for LGBTQ people. Um, and this says about 27% of California adolescents say their view is gender nonconforming. I believe this was from 2019. Um, and so those students are the students who are probably largely here on this campus right now. For folks who are thinking like, wow, who's turning on these little young kids queer? No one's turning them queer. It's finally now society is getting to a place where they feel safe enough to actually acknowledge this is who they are. And as society becomes more open and inclusive, we will probably expect that these numbers will increase with that as well. So by 2030, everyone will be queer. Just get ready. <laughs> That's not true. That's not how science works. <laughs> Anyway, so why do I share all this? So now that we know, okay, we can all agree, there's probably LGBTQ people in your organization on your campus. Agreed? Okay, we're going to keep on going now. So with that, why does this actually matter? And so we think that we know that these people are here. I'm going to talk a little about what are their experiences once they are here in society, community, and then our institutions. So LGBTQ plus individuals receive SNAP, that's what we call CalFresh here in the state, uh, benefits at two times the rate of non-LGBTQ plus people. Non-binary folks specifically, as I kind of shared with you that definition up there, um, and this is not higher ed specific, this is community specific, 52% uh, report being bullied, 55% said that they were assaulted as an adult, 11% were exposed to conversion therapy, which has huge impacts on mental health, 57% live 200% below the federal poverty line, and then 94% have considered suicide, and 39% have attempted. I'm going to pause there. As many times as I've read this research from this study, um, it's just hard to read through it. As I think about not just the research study, but the chosen family that I um, am a part of, the community members that I engage with, the students that I serve on a regular basis, as well as the students who are not even here anymore for me to serve. Like these are real people in our communities and at our colleges. Beyond just our students or community members, I also want us to think about employees, but we have many of us here in charge of hiring. A recent study showed that 80% of non-binary employees believe that being non-binary hurt their opportunities during the job search process. Uh, and the study also showed that candidates who use they and them on their resume receive fewer interview invitations. I've been researching this for a while. I'm not going to go through every study, so I did a little mini lit review for you. And these are some of the most common challenges that LGBTQ plus students face in higher education. So as you can see, physical violence, microaggressions, misgendering and dead naming, negative classroom interactions, uh, finding community and a sense of belonging and a sense of support, uh, a lack of representation within their faculty, their staff, their administrators, their healthcare practitioners, uh, limited support with identity exploration as they are trying to come out, um, as well as a lack of access to queer and trans affirming health services and mental health providers, um, lack of all gender inclusive facilities, restrooms, but I'll also add in our locker rooms for those who are taking PE classes or in athletics, um, and then a lack of intersectional resources. Oftentimes when we do have LGBT specific resources, they're often uh, centering and dominated by white Eurocentric policies, practices, and cultures. And then a lack of queer and trans knowledge by the people that they are expected to support them and educate them. 
So all of these things that I just named compound to impact the mental health of our queer and trans students and queer and trans people in our communities, which also impact our ability to succeed, specifically within higher education. Going a little bit further, specifically with our LGBTQ students, a National Campus Climate Survey found that 33% of gay and lesbian students and 38% of transgender students seriously considered transferring because of the hostile climate on their campus. Trans students who leave their institutions often report that they left because it was unwelcoming and insensitive, campus climate, they couldn't find trans affirming support, support services, so they chose to take a leave, to assume that college wasn't for them, or to try to find an institution that they could transfer to that would be more uh, supportive for them in their gender identity. Queer and trans students also are more likely to seriously consider suicide, experience housing and food insecurity, and be rejected by their family. We might often think that these things on a national scale are true in places like where I'm from in Mississippi and Alabama. However, in our state capital, where I most recently lived in Sacramento for five years, uh, a survey came out in 2017 that reported in Sacramento there was a 30% increase in youth homelessness for LGBTQ plus youth. And I also have seen other studies that showed during the pandemic that number went up even higher. A National Transgender Discrimination Survey showed that 24% of our trans students reported being harassed, 15% said they dropped out because of that harassment as well, and then when we look at the intersections of race and gender identity, trans students of color report much higher rates of harassment and bias that they face compared to their white trans students too. So as we think about this, um, this is real for many of our folks. And for me personally, much of my collegiate experience also faced similar struggles. And when I faced those struggles, it never really felt like I had a community or a space to support me. So I faced bias incidents, harassment, and even hate crimes with no space to gain support and no knowledge of actually how to report. So when I experienced bias incidents and hate crimes as a student, um, I never reported. By reporting such an incident meant that I also had to disclose why I was targeted. Um, and did not know if the person I would actually report that to would respond with victim blaming, homophobic and transphobic statements or actions, or if my situation would even be taken seriously. During these times, I had no social support systems to discuss this mistreatment because most of my main college community or the campus ministries that I knew were anti-LGBTQ. My undergraduate college did not have any institutional resources dedicated to LGBTQ plus students Sadly, today, in 2023, they still do not. A Pride Center or an LGBT Center or LGBT Services offers a place for our students, also our faculty and staff, to report these incidents and to advocate, find a place to advocate for them through a process of actually reporting and knowing what happens after you report. So if you think about anti-LGBTQ bias and harassment on our campuses or in our community, these obviously impact youth and our students that we're talking about but they also impact everyone in our community and everyone in our college community. Some of the most intense anti-LGBTQ violence that I experienced was actually when I was a faculty member and as an administrator. Um, a life-changing experience that occurred while I was leading a study abroad trip was I was targeted based off my gender expression, I was physically attacked and hospitalized. Later, I was interviewed by the campus security and some more senior administrators, and I felt pressured not to fully disclose why I was targeted. I was also still in shock, on lots of pain medication, also feeling aspects of shame for why I was attacked. Even though I knew better, it was hard for me to combat these thoughts of shame, the thought that I deserved this somehow, and that I should not have taken the risk to show up as my authentic self, or to go to a country that I could be targeted in this way. This also occurred in a country where being LGBTQ plus was illegal, and I couldn't report this to the police. But even now, when I experience or observe anti-LGBTQ related microaggressions or hear anti-LGBTQ legislation across the country, that fear of violence reemerges in me. I still have physical reminders of this attack, like a scar on my knee, the fragility of my shoulder that can't fully rotate. So when something comes up, the emotional reminders are also there around this tragedy. When tragedies happen like the mass shooting at Club Q in Colorado Springs, these fears reemerge. Any anti-LGBTQ violence anywhere in this country or even this world reminds me somehow how, how far we still need to go and reminds me that hate and violence are present in our society, even in San Francisco and in the Bay Area. 
A positive, however, after the club cube shooting last fall, um, I received multiple text messages and calls from my college president, from my colleagues, and from my teammates because they knew this was impactful for me, not just as an administrator and educator, but for me as a human and me as a community member with them as well. So I challenge all of us here today to see those folks who we supervise, who we teach, who we support in different ways as our coworkers or even our supervisors, that these folks are full humans, they have identities outside of just their titles and their roles at our organizations and their institutions. I often hesitate to share stories of trauma like this because my goal is not to invoke sympathy or to pity uh, that people often have. I often think about self, uh, talking about trauma, and specifically my own trauma, um, as a form of education. And I'm trying to be very careful not to turn moments like this into trauma porn. As we think about this idea of trauma porn, where this has become very common within media, within education, within research, is that we highlight people's experiences of pain just as a form of education and remove their humanity. Um, I'm always hesitant specifically to put youth on panels. Um, as an educator at multiple institutions, people often want to say like, oh, we would love to learn around the experiences of our undocumented students, can you make a panel? We would love to hear about trans students' experiences. Can we have a group of black students to educate our police around police violence? And so I often caution folks, specifically colleges, around panels of youth who are coming from marginalized and traumatized experiences. Me, as a grown adult who is mostly healed, um, is comfortable at this point sharing about my experiences as a way to motivate and to educate. As I think about all of this, uh, spaces and resources like a Pride Center would have transformed my collegiate experience. I would have known that I mattered, that I had a community, and that I could confide in a faculty or staff member as I faced academic obstacles and life challenges. I was fortunate somehow to find strength and resilience to persist and to graduate. Sadly, that's not the case for many of our students and our students within our community college system. However, once I was actually exposed to an environment that named LGBTQ plus people in student services, in academic majors, in mental health providers, in curriculum, policies, programs, events, and awards, and in scholarships, I began to thrive. I began to feel confident that this was a place that I belonged in, and it was a place that I could take on leadership roles more successfully. As I was at my graduate institution that did have an LGBTQ center, within three years, I went from being a scared and shameful graduate student to thriving, to thriving as an academic administrator and then eventually serving as the director of the LGBT center. My personal growth, my academic development, my career achievement would have only occurred without, it only occurred because of an institution that invested in LGBTQ people and in, in the LGBTQ resources that supported me. I am the product of an institutionalized action advocating for LGBTQ justice and equity within education. So today, I hope that I haven't made everyone super sad. <laughs> and I want us to think about all of these issues that I've been talking around and also move us into a form of action. As someone who is working in community college and in nonprofit work, I want us to think about what is action and how do we move forward with this as well. Before we get into talking about our organizations, our policies, our inclusive pedagogy, I want to talk about all y'all first. So before you were here as educators or in your roles or whatever you might be doing, you were here as people. You are someone's friend, someone's sibling, someone's parent, someone's neighbor, someone's auntie. That's what I want to talk about now. We're all humans here first. A couple of actions I want you to think about as you as a person and as a community member. One, ensure your students, your employees, those around you know that you are a fierce advocate for LGBTQ people. Oftentimes when people kind of later knew around like what my work was or my identity was, they would say, why didn't you tell me sooner? And then I would start to think about it and be like, what did you ever do or say that made me think that you would be a safe person to tell? Oftentimes those people were doing microaggressive things that made me realize they were not a safe person to tell with that too. So if you know that you have this probably little queer person in your life and they haven't told you you want them to tell you, think about what messages are you sending with your words, your actions, your ideas that are sending to that person that you are a safe and welcoming person to do, to be able to tell that to as well. Another action, commit to learning. Yes, you're all here, this is great. I can tell all y'all are engaged in learning and also commit to unlearning. Y'all, we all have a whole bunch of nonsense in our heads that we need to deconstruct and to take out with that as well. Um, always be aware of what you don't know. That's the scariest part. We don't know what we don't know. 
Learn to listen. If, there's, if you don't have all the answers, the easiest thing you can do is listening and making sure that person knows that you're here to support them and you ask them what they need in that space too. As you're learning and listening, knowing that if you know one gay person's experience, you know one gay person's experience. You don't know every gay person's experience. You know one trans person's experience, that's one trans person's experience. Whenever I be like, oh my god, yes, I have a gay brother, I know exactly what you need, I'm exactly turned off at that moment engaging with him as well. I also challenge you to explore your own identity. Everybody all out here has a gender identity and a sexual identity. Even if it's one you don't have to think about, that's why you should be thinking about it. That's telling when everybody else has to think about theirs because they're marginalized and minoritized, but when cisgender and heterosexual people never reflect on what their identity is and the privilege that comes along with that as well. And that is work. And so I challenge you all now to examine and dig into that work. It's a lot easier to read some statistics than think about all these other people that we want to learn about. Learning about your own self is the hardest part of this journey, too. And so I challenge you all to take the time, to take the reflection, to find folks who hold you accountable and push you to grow. With that, I want us to challenge others. If you're looking around this room, you probably see people you work with, you have classes with, whatever that might be. Um, challenge others. Uh, challenge yourself as well. And so be willing to be confronted. So when you misgender someone and use the wrong pronouns, and they say, hey, actually, I use they and them pronouns, um, be okay with that. Thank them for holding you accountable and learning from that as well. Many times when we uh, have a microaggressive word that we say, or whatever it is, someone holds us accountable, we say, oh, I didn't mean like that. We don't have to say that. Just own it, listen, thank them, and commit to doing better with that as well. I ask all of you, specifically you heard Barnard College and Moran, to challenge policies, challenge practices. And so I don't know if any of our senior administrators are in here, but I'm asking, inviting all of you to challenge your senior administrators. Hold them accountable with that as well. If you're in a committee and you're in a meeting and you're seeing something like, wow, I don't need this inclusive for non-binary students, or I don't need this inclusive for undocumented students, then be okay to say, ask that question. Okay, this curriculum is great. How do you think our non-binary students will receive this type of curriculum? That's all you have to do is ask that question. I ask that those who are in a position to hire, hire, support, and develop LGBTQ employees. I know that a lot of my roles when I was the director of multicultural centers, people would say, oh, can you go hire some more black faculty? And I would. I would go hire a bunch of black faculty, and they would get there. And then a year later, they were all gone. Because we after we hire them, we recruit them, we have to do more than tokenize them and put them on a brochure. We have to find ways to support, develop, and to coach those folks so once we recruit minoritized and historically excluded populations, we find ways to make sure that they are enjoying their life here and that they're thriving with that as well. The last thing I want to make sure that people know, many times folks are like, I want to do something, I have no idea what to do, I don't have enough knowledge or skills. You know what you can do? You can donate. We will take your money. And so when you think about nonprofits, whatever it might be, folks doing work to support gender minoritized uh, and oppressed groups, um, if you can't do anything else, donate some kind of fund so they can continue to do the work that they do as well. For all of you here at the College of Marin, if there is a LGBTQ plus scholarship, you can donate to that. If there is not one, you can start one. Um, I'm honored today to be here to speak to y'all, and y'all are compensating me for this work that I'm doing, and I'm able to use these funds to fund a scholarship at the College of San Mateo for LGBTQ plus students. If you don't have one here at this college, here's your action to go ahead and do that. After we all can join the lobby and figure out a way to do that too. So let's think about our institution, and if you are not a part of this institution, use your own organization. Many of these will be applicable to non-higher ed organizations with that as well. So as I think about things that are in the classroom, uh, in the curriculum, um, in the community, in the outreach, in the marketing, this crosses so many spaces as well. All of our colleges in the, in the state of California has to do an SCA plan, a Student Equity and Achievement Plan, our equity plan is what we might call it. Make sure that it's inclusive of LGBTQ plus people. As you're creating actions and efforts to support LGBTQ people, make sure that they are involved and that their voice is centered in this work as well. Too often I see our institutions creating services for black students or undocumented students or trans students, and those people aren't even in the room. Those people have no idea what it is as well. Those folks, their voices need to be centered and they need to control the narrative to know what they need to be successful in these spaces. As we think about basic needs, most of our colleges are also getting money to do basic needs, food and housing insecurity. As you saw in that research earlier, 
Korean transgenders are overrepresented when we're talking about housing and food insecurity. So making sure that everything in there is centering and understanding their identities and their perspective. I often go back to Maslow's hierarchy. When we think about how our students are going to succeed, do they have food, shelter, and safety? If they don't have those things, they're probably not going to be super successful as students. As I ran my mouth earlier about data, find ways to get the data. Um, and if you don't know how to do that, I'm happy to have a conversation after about, around some strategies to make sure institutional research or other ways that you're getting data with that too. If you do a campus climate study, um, making sure that gender and sexuality is included in the demographic section, making sure it's asked in an inclusive and sensitive way, and also I encourage you to include employees when you're doing campus climate studies and not just for students. And then when you're talking about disproportionately impacted students, making sure you're including LGBTQ plus people. Even if your local level data doesn't show that, national data all shows that LGBTQ plus students are disproportionately impacted. And for folks who aren't familiar with that language, we're typically talking about graduation, persistence, retention, and course success rates, that LGBTQ students are at lower rates for almost every one of those compared to general population of students. Build community. Sometimes this is the easiest thing that you can do. Um, there's a lot of times that folks critique kind of a student club, or I would be hosting an LGBTQ student club meeting, and it would be like, you know, we ordered pizza and we watched a queer film together. And but like, isn't that a misuse of college funds? No, actually there's tons of research that shows just being together in a sense of community does a lot towards retention. When those students have a support system and a faculty member that they trust, they're going to succeed. So find ways to build community, even if it's the easiest low-hanging fruit you can do. $10 to buy some popcorn and getting a movie from the library, that's all you really need to get going with this as well. I also encourage you to find ways to build community for your employees too. And that could be an employee resource group. With that, I'll also nudge you to say, compensate those faculty and staff who are leading those. This should not be free labor for them. Often as we ask minoritized employees to do free labor for the college or the organization, Train them, develop them, give them release time, and pay them, or whatever it might be, to do those jobs for employee resource groups. Look at your policies, specifically AB 620. If you don't know what that is, please Google it. Your college is required to have an AB 620 officer. Uh, if you're familiar with Title IX, Title IX also includes gender and sexuality. And so, although that definition I gave you around what sex assigned at birth is, um, Title IX, uh, Department of Ed, and OCR don't believe my definition or sociology definitions. They say sex discrimination includes uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, and gender expression. Although technically I don't agree with it, legally I will take it and use that to protect people on my campus. So make sure your Title IX is updated and the education is inclusive of trans and queer people in Title IX too. <clears throat> Making sure that uh, training and development is available for employees. I've been at so many campuses where we tell our faculty, go create inclusive curriculum. They're like, yay! Wait, what's that mean again? And so making sure that as we're telling people to do this work and who to serve, that we're providing more professional development opportunities. Most of the people who work in our organizations want to do well. They want to support trans students. Do they know how? That's the question where we are right now, too. We need to give them the tools to actually do what we're asking them to do. Providing advocacy and support. Bias incidents are going to be happening on this campus all the time. Sometimes they don't fall in Title IX, they don't fall under EEO, they don't fall under AB 620. However, they still have huge impacts on campus climate and how people succeed. So you do need a bias reporting system to hold people accountable with that as well. And then lastly, as I'm thinking about this, overly communicate. Make sure that every spot on this campus, every message, those folks who are queer and trans are often terrified to go to college. High school experiences have often been very bad for queer and trans people, and the thought of walking into another educational institution campus can be really intimidating. So for folks to come to the College of Marin or to any of your community providers, make sure that without a doubt, queer and trans people know that they are valued, they are acknowledged, and they will be protected at that institution. All of this happens with partnerships. So I talked about things, oftentimes at college, you say like, well, this is an inclusive curriculum thing, or this is a student services thing, or just make a learning community and the rest of us don't have to think about this anymore. With all of that, we need all people on board at every division and department to think about how does queer and trans advocacy fall into their departments. I gave you a couple of easy examples that I already mentioned most of them as well. Some things that I haven't mentioned, IT also needs to be involved with this, thinking about 
can people choose their names, employees, and students? Um, are pronouns available to have on rosters? Um, what about your LMS? What about your ID cards? What about diplomas? These all need to be inclusive of people's gender, gender identity, and chosen names too. And then HR, as we talk about collecting data for students, it's critical that HR also collects data on employees too. With all of this, I hope that folks are like, yes, I'm ready to go, let's go do this. I want to prepare you. If this was easy, we would have all done it by now. Please expect resistance. Be prepared for resistance. For someone, me, who is a full-time social justice educator, sometimes I forget. And then when there is resistance, I get a little bit caught off guard. So I always have to remind myself, sadly, the things that remind me are hurtful things that happen to me and the loved ones around me. So if you think about making radical change, we are trying to change institutions that were created for white, straight, non-disabled, upper middle class Christian men. That's who these institutions were created for. Guess what? That's largely not our students. So we're going to try to change an institution and a culture of higher education that has hundreds of years of not wanting to change. Be prepared for resistance. Some of that resistance could be religious, as we've talked about quite a bit today. Some of it could be splitting resources. As we think about it, we've been doing quite a bit for uh, populations who are racially minoritized. We definitely want to continue that. What I challenge people to do is to do this work with an intersectional lens and to invest the time to make sure that we have coalition for this as well. We should not be pitting our minoritized and marginalized populations against each other for a very slim amount of resources too. People will say you're being too sensitive, so being prepared to engage in that as well. And also people might say this is too complicated. Yeah, it's complicated. Guess what? All of us as humans, we're complicated too. So why would the solutions not also be equally uh, complicated? So as we think about doing action and changing your organizations, our community colleges are getting funding for this as well. So as soon as you kind of create ideas, if you're going to senior administrators or people who hold the, the budget strings, um, and people are like, what? Just so you know, last year, the state of California, or California Chancellor's Office, we were able to get $10 million for LGBTQ advocacy work. There's a pot of money somewhere on this campus that is meant for that. I hope it's being used. Um, and if it's not, start asking questions. Um, a good thing about that as well, it was just to prove that we're getting three more years of funding for our college systems. And so this fall, you should be getting a little bit more money and also for the next two years to sustain this work. I will also say this should not be the only resources that are going towards LGBTQ advocacy. Institutions should also use other types of their budget, including the general funds, to support LGBTQ advocacy as well. With that, I know that this was a quick run through as well. Um, as mentioned, this book that I wrote with Dr. Emily Mitchell, who is the chair of the CCC LGBTQ Summit. Um, we started the Pride Center at American River College. We kind of went on a tour teaching other colleges how to create LGBT services and centers. So people kept asking for sewing uh, support. We said, I guess we should write a book about this. So really this book is how do you institutionalize these things if you have no idea where to start, Get this book and read it. Um, I'm happy to send a copy over to you as well. So as we move to closing, I'm honored to get to hang out with all y'all today during this summit uh, to share some of my lived experiences and knowledge. Um, my college's LGBTQ advocacy efforts were an investment into me, and that's allowed me to invest in the lives of many other students coming from marginalized backgrounds that are similar to mine, as well as those that are not similar to mine. I've been an administrator and educator for LGBTQ students, for students of color, undocumented students, students facing housing insecurity, our veteran students, international students, disabled students. Um, as well as I've been able to use that advocacy and support to publish four books based on communities of color, religious communities, and LGBT advocacy. I'm only here today as a vice president in our California community college system because a college chose to invest into a pride center in LGBTQ plus advocacy. Our systems, our collegiate systems efforts for LGBTQ students, they recognize that a population of our community college, they not only exist, but they matter. Their mental health matters, and they matter enough for us to actually invest in their future and to help them succeed in college. I want to challenge all of us here to take ownership of your responsibility in making our college, as well as your sphere of influence, more welcoming and more inclusive for all communities that are marginalized. Specifically today, I'm going to name LGBTQ plus people. And I know that some of you in here have been championing
for LGBTQ plus people tirelessly and for decades now. I thank you for the foundational work that many of you have committed. I also acknowledge that there are probably LGBTQ plus employees who are in here who have existed on this campus before we ever started having these conversations. You also were the ones here who were supporting students, the LGBTQ plus students who had no space or no club. You found ways to mentor those LGBTQ students, to support them when they were afraid or when they were harmed, and you loved them when sometimes no one else was loving them. I thank you for your courage and for saving the lives of our students here at the College of Marin. We really are just beginning this journey to transform our campuses into environments that truly champion for equity in education. It's going to be hard, but we can't stop here. I thank you all for letting me speak to you today, for being here, and staying engaged all this time. Thank you. I think we have about 10 minutes for questions, maybe. Is that okay, Stiller? Also, very good. <laughs> that was good. That was good. 
Okay. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Very good. The next one we will do September 20th. September 9th? Okay. Anyone closer to that? I like it. Let's do it. Last but not least, let's pick December 15th. 24. 24. Excellent. Very good. So is everybody's birthday in like May? Like what was <laughs> We are cyber. So thank you. Give yourselves a hand. We are about to break out. We are small but mighty crew here, and it's all good because we're one or two are gathered. We're having a party. And so please show our love to our afternoon workshops because they're going to show love to you, whoever's in the space. And so um, we have our fantastic T. Perales um, that is doing a workshop on brave spaces. That's going to be assigned math, math and nursing, room 224. Professor Dwayne Big Eagle, who is in our ethnic studies department, he is going to be presenting 500 years of trauma, and that is going to be in our academic center 103. Uh, Nisham Edwards of our early childhood program, uh, she is doing a talk on creating trauma sensitive environments for all learners. That's an AC 240. We have Ishmael and Anissa. They will be at AC 105. Heart hijack the effects of white body supremacy on our hearts and a somatic musical invitation. It's going to be beautiful. Downstairs in this building, we have a yoga session going on. We've had so much amazing work that happened during the day. Now it might be time for you to decompress. And so yoga is taking place downstairs. And last, we have Mark Parker, who is in SNN 226, who will be discussing the role of youth in building safe and healthy community, another great session. Following the concluding your sessions, if you were here yesterday, you likely participated in our final drum session with Jamea Brown, who will be joining us once again to close out our fantastic symposium. That will be in AC 255 at about 3, 10, 3, 15. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Grab a cookie as you walk to your workshops.
How's everyone doing? Good. This is awesome. So, uh, the Chancellor's Office, obviously, physically based out of Sacramento, but um, thank goodness to hybrid. Um, I actually live in the Bay Area, so actually, I love, always love to travel to colleges, and this makes it very easy with three kids at home. I typically don't want to travel overnight, so this is a quick hop and skip. So, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, to really kind of share some of my uh, thoughts, really also um, to bring you some updates from the Chancellor's Office. Um, before I go in there, um, really gratitude for the organizers for this great event, um, Stormy, uh, who is not here today, for those of you who know her, please say, uh, say hi to her for me. Um, she's been a partner with us since I uh, came to the Chancellor's Office uh, three years ago, really supporting students with disabilities. And I think that partnership um, has really evolved uh, into a, a very collaborative uh, partnership with a very firm understanding that often we, we may not always agree on everything, right? Because what we are, our, our positions and our organizational uh, priorities. But what's really important is to have honest conversations and ground our conversations in serving students. And then we will have a coordinated approach moving forward, right? And that is something that I really want to emphasize. And I think the theme of building a culture of community is that, right? Community is about bringing diverse voices and opinions and disagreements, but moving forward together in the same direction, but not every step, not you know, synchronizing every step of the way, right? That is not what a diversity, what diversity means. So how do we harness the diversity and treat that as our superpower moving forward is something that uh, you know the Chancellor's Office hold uh, near and dear. We deal with a ton of different stakeholders and we have difficult conversations. And they are difficult because the issues are complex. Right? Not because we go in and say we may disagree on something. Disagreement is a good thing. So that we can hear all the, we can hear all the opinions and take all the things into consideration. Because no one, no one knows the answer, right? And we have to move forward together. So um, you know, again, like thinking about a culture of community. Um, you know, we live in a very fast-paced world and hyper-connected, enhanced by technology. But I think as, at the same time as individuals, we often feel uh, isolated and detached. Um, so how do, we, uh, how do we then really evolve the thinking of community and look at how we uh, really nurture the sense of belonging and togetherness in the virtual world and in a hybrid virtual plus in-person world, right? So that's something I think as we move forward, we have to continue to think about across the board in higher education, in, in economic development, in providing social uh, uh, social services to individuals. So, and you know, how we're bound by, you know, the collective responsibility that, like for example, for in the case of mental health, right? It's, it's not an individual issue, it's a community collective responsibility. So how do we go beyond the boundaries of institutions and really hold that and, and, and to come together and say, hey, we serve the same people. They're called differently, right? They're called students in higher education, they're called members in, in healthcare or others. And how do we think about them as that's our community and we have to support one another to succeed, right? So I'm gonna move on to the next slide, but let me make sure technology wise I'm there. Is there a cooker? I got it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, just a quick update for those of you who are not from our system, but we are very excited to welcome our uh, new chancellor, new permanent chancellor, the first female permanent chancellor to the community college system, Dr. Sonia Christian. And um, she uh, has been on the job for um, less than three months, but she has already pushed out a very bold vision. It's called Vision 2030 a roadmap for the community colleges. Um, what's important to note that just because the word vision is there does not mean that we're changing the vision, which is vision for success, which is our North Star, right? The vision for success has significance in our system because it really shifted the vantage point from what we as institutions uh, should do to what students need. Right? When we shift to students, the way we, and which mandates that, the way we 
the way we design our programs, deliver our services will have to be different. Because people are holistic beings, so how do we provide holistic support, right? So Vision 2030 is really, I, I think of it as more of an action framework. So we have the whole vision and vision for success. What does that look like specifically, right, from now until 2030 to provide, to engage the field, to provide uh, field guidance, to also uh, have, uh, to have system development conversations to think about barrier removal, and then, you know, everything, nothing's free. So how do we think about the price tag and what does that look like for research development to think about federal opportunities, state opportunities, and philanthropic opportunities. And then uh, policy reform is critical because we know so many um, constraints that we see on the ground in practice and microaggressions, racism, if you go deep, right, all of that, um, many of that is still written deep into our existing uh, federal uh, and state laws and policies. So how do we really think about that and fundamentally interrogate them and dismantle them together? And um, another quick slide on Vision 2030. Um, it's quite comprehensive with action uh, uh, with action items and others, but I think this uh, this visual is a good summary of, of what to expect. There are really three goals for our students. Uh, to support our students, and it's not just existing students, but potential students, which is really the entire California community, right? The California community colleges are lifelong learning institutions. Everyone can come back, and everyone should come back and, and pick us, right? And I want to say pick. We're not entitled to have the students. Students will have to see value in the California community college system. They have to see unconditional belonging in our system to want to come back. So we have to earn that. And we're more than capable to do, uh, of doing that, right? And when we think about the state, the state of California, when the state of California wants anything that's equitable, they have to lean on, on in us. We have the expertise, and, and most importantly, we have the students to really support that state agenda. So how do we think about bringing equity in everything we do in terms of access, bringing more students to us not just through campaign. You've seen the billboards of I can campaign, hopefully in airports and highways. But what's more important is we have to bring our services to our to all of these people who need them, individuals who need them, right? Um, so we have to obviously have strategies on how to find captive audience and whatnot. But I think you know um, when we wait for people to come, it's already a privileged system because who can come? Only the people who are more savvy, who have resources, who have the time that can come, right? So how do we bring the services to them? It's going to be a critical next step as we think about it. And equity and support without saying, I feel like this group is an ally here. Um, so how do we really think about that? And I think equity and mental health falls squarely in this conversation, right? And the last bit is equity and success is about building out metrics so we can define what it looks like and then desegregate data to make sure it's equitable for all students. And then if you look at the strategic directions, uh, you know, you see one kind of very specific around my glory of degree attainment for our students. And you can see the strategy has been diversified, not only just transfers, but also California Community College baccalaureate degree programs, right? So when there's a gap in the marketplace, how do we step up and build, right, to fill that gap for our students? And then workforce and economic development obviously is super critical. Most of our students don't come in just for experience. They're coming to advance economic, mobile, uh, economic and social mobility. So at the end of the day, we're in the higher education business but how do we also stay in the prosperity business, right? So students will actually gain something and they want to come back next time and tell their friends, right? Just like all sales, like how do we make this experience an awesome one? And the last bit is future of learning. And if you think about um, advanced data analytics and generative AI, this is much more of us responding to the reality of today, right? Chat GPT is a good example, right? How do we continue to lean into technology innovations, right? And then also responding to it, right? And think about using these tools, using technology and data analytics to really better support, provide customer support, adaptive learning for our students. All right, so then that, I'm gonna kind of now dive into kind of more of the program around what the Chancellor's Office is thinking in terms of mental well-being, right? So that's, this is a quick 
some of those quick all day student data from at a system level. I'm sure at a local level you guys have even better data, but what we're seeing is pre-pandemic, right? One in four students experience a diagnosable illness. And again, this is, we know this is underestimation, right? With all the stigma and all that. Uh, we know the situation is much worse, but also this is what we have. So we have a pre-pandemic, one in four, and you have mid-pandemic, you have two-thirds of the students reporting higher level of stress. And then we, uh, we also did a 2021 student center listening tour to many of the colleges across our system. And when we asked the student, right, what is your number one challenge, mental health, is comes up over and over again. And most recently, we did a uh, statewide uh, student enrollment survey looking at prospective students and students who were once in our system. Again, a third of the students dropped out of the school from our system because they have to prioritize mental health. Right, again, I'm talking to the allies here, so I don't need to convince you and tell you how dire the situation is. But I think it's important for us always to kind of level set before we even engage in that conversation. And couple of slides, right? This is what students say generally. Now, this is a, some of those statements are, uh, most of the statements were collected uh, in the context of basic needs and uh, financial, financial aid. But what I want to emphasize is those are student friction points, right? And even though they are talking about money, they're talking about the struggles. But every single of these conversations uh, reflects multiple uh, stressors, and that will impact <coughs> mental health. Right? So when we think about this, every time a student says, I, have to, I want to do this, but I'm doing this, and I have to do other things, and all of that creates additional pressure right, for our system and urgency for our system to really not just address mental illness, but really looking at mental well-being across the board. We all need it before students need it. And this is another visual I thought would be helpful. When students are seeking help, what is the student experience? And that speaks to really the difference between how we design programs and how students experience our programs, right? This shift of vintage point. And all these bubbles are the great things that we're doing for our students. And the funding that we have, um, we have been able to advocate for our students. And there are more. I mean, I just couldn't fit more bubbles in there, right? But this is how we, unfortunately, this is how we structure our programs. Coming all the way from, like, 